Uh, before we get started, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson to reestablish a quorum. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I will begin with um, calling the roll with uh, Chair Moore. Present. Vice Chair Brown. Vice Chair Brown is absent. Chair Moore is present. Uh, Member Bradford. Member Bradford is absent. Member Grills. Present. Member Grills is present. Member Holder. Here. Member Holder is present. <clears throat> Member uh, Joan Sawyer. Member Joan, Joan Sawyer is absent. Member Lewis. Present. Member <clears throat> Lewis is present. Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is present. <coughs> Member Tamaki. Here. Member Tamaki is present. Madam Chair, <clears throat> there are nine members on the task force. The number required for a quorum is five. The number present is seven. Madam Chair, a quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Uh, we'll now uh, turn to public comment. Uh, uh, Madam, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, the number present is six. That's still a quorum, right? Yes, it's still a quorum. I just wanted to <laughs> correct Thank the number. <laughs> Thank you. The number present is six. A quorum has been established, so we'll turn to the next item on the agenda, which is number 15, welcoming remarks by elected officials. Um, if there are none, we'll turn to public comment. Um, so I'll turn to Ms. Martin Walton uh, for public comment. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Moore, task force members, and members of the public. My name is Aisha Martin Walton, and I am with the Department of Justice, and the task force would like to hear from everyone. Today we will have two hours for public comment. One hour will be for members of the public on the phone lines and one hour for members of the public who have joined us in person. If you expressed interest in participating in public comment when you checked in this morning, you received a number card. We will hear from as many uh, guests as possible during the one hour period. We will call numbers in groups of five or your name, so please stay comfortably seated until you hear your number range called. Please remember that each speaker will have two minutes for, your, for public comment. Once you have completed your comments, please leave your numbers on the podium, and please be in, advised that in fairness to everyone, at the two minute mark, you may be politely interrupted. However, just know that the public comment period is during each meeting. There's going to be a meeting May 2nd and June 30th, and that the task force encourages everyone to participate. You may also submit written comments at any time via email at reparationstaskforce at dlj.ca.gov. So with that, let us begin. Uh, we're going to open up the, the phone lines, and we have Keeley from AT&T assisting us this morning. Keeley, are you on the line? I am. Good morning. So ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to make good morning, if you'd like to make a comment, please press one then zero on your phone. You'll hear an acknowledgement that you've been placed in the queue. You can remove yourself by repeating the one zero command. If you're on a speakerphone, please pick up your handset. Today's comments will be anonymous and you'll be called on by your line number. Once again, for comments, it's one and then zero. We'll go to line 54. Line 54. Hello, this is uh, Prince Ramsey's. Um, I wanted to reiterate what I said about the for California. Um, in addition to it being only for descendants of persons in the United States, we need to make it such that there again, there's no double dipping. So we can make it one based on being born in California. And if somehow you were a descendant but not born in the state or born outside of the United States, it should be based on where you spent the most amount of time in your life. Um, and if somehow, again, you spend an equal amount of time in multiple places where you spent the most amount of time recently. Um, and also, when it comes to the thing we need to talk about is the racial wealth gap in California, we know that it's greater than the national 350K racial wealth gap, 
The question is how much? And by calculating that, we could figure out what is owed in California. Thank you. Thank you. Keely, next caller, please. We'll go next to line number 91. Hello. We can, can hear you. Me? Please go ahead. Thank you. Well, I'm calling because there was a comment made yesterday that um, white people um, that came after slavery were not, shouldn't be held responsible. And um, that's actually not true. Um, those that came after slavery have been paying reparations to the indigenous community and to the Jewish community and continue to do so, even though they are not the ones that originally stole the land or the ones that pulled the switch in those Nazi gas chambers. So that's actually incorrect. Also, as Martin Luther King told us, this country could have a long time ago had uh, could have repaired the descendants of those that were enslaved a long time ago, but instead chose to spite them by calling to Europe and other places for their huddled masses and then giving the people that came free land and even money to cultivate that land and even money when not when the government didn't want them to cultivate the land. So, um, unfortunately, our school systems are not teaching history with its proper right and in its proper context. And so that is why we have people thinking that they're not responsible. We also have to understand that there was a such thing as fiscal discrimination, because even um, when they call those people from other places, they gave them land and money, but then told black people they were not allowed. Also, um, I know the First World War, there were many GIs that could not exercise, black GIs that were not even allowed to exercise the GI Bill. Um, also, banks were allowed to discriminate based on color. So you had white families that were given loans that they did not even qualify for, despite black families that did. So the thing is, even if you came after slavery, you still benefited. Thank you so slavery. much for your comments. And I'm sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your sentence. Thank you. Keely, next caller, please. We'll go next to line 65. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, I, uh, my name is Matthew Burton. It's fifth generation in California. And uh, you probably heard a lot from my brother, Jonathan. But I wanted to first thank the task force for some of the work that's been done. And Chair Moore, thank you for holding it down. But for some of you others here, I was disheartened to know that land wasn't taken consideration because there was no data for land. You know, California, we have over 100 million acres of land. 43 million acres, acres are used for agricultural. When the gold rush came and the gold ran out, what do you think people did? They led to agriculture. Okay, that's what we did. And you took farmland from descendants of slaves, black people that were working the land. You did eminent domain, you did everything else hundreds of acres of land that you took from black people, but you can't calculate that. You have Folsom Lake here in California. Folsom Lake was a Negro bar that they changed the name to now the Black Miners Bar, but that was a descendant of slaves as well. You changed that name, so you have that. You have Allensworth. You have all these things that you could take into consideration, but you don't. Agriculture was the way that we made a living, the way that we provided. Let's take Coloma, for example, okay? The land that you took from my ancestors, Guess what we did with it? We made it a state park, but not only did we make it a state park, we allowed park officials and government officials to live there for free, rent free. That documentation is there. Calculate the rent that you allowed them to live there for free when you took land from descendants of slaves saying that it was unlivable and you burnt up orchards. Let's talk about that. No one's talking about that. And Dr. Javon Scott Lewis, you've held it down, but you know there's data on that. The nefarious acts that people did 
and took against our ancestors, it's out there. But when you don't talk about the theft, the land, the grab, everything that happened, the totality of it, that's where the frustration comes from. But I do thank you. But we're also at the same time understanding that people like W.R. Strong, who's the 90th mayor of New York, he came to California using produce from our orchards in Coloma and all across California to become a millionaire. Thank you. Strong, thank you so mayor. much for your comments this morning. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to call in. Keely, our next caller, please. I'm 50. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Shauna Charles is a fraud. How do you have a communications group that doesn't have an active website, that doesn't have a landing spot for the reparations task force, and operates by themselves? I don't Through incompetence and nobody seems to care. We are at the 11th hour, and the average black person in California has no clue that this task force has been operating for the last two years. It is black people who are trying to keep gas in their car, a roof over their head, and fighting through the actual hostile racist working environment that needs to know about what the task force has done. And Charles and Shauna Charles is failing those black people by withholding pertinent information that needs to be disseminated in order for these people to understand what has been discussed. Her strategy to get the word out. These are questions that should have been asked before she was appointed. Noam Chomsky said the most sophisticated form of propaganda is to act as though you are for something when you're actually against it. And this is ever so true with this fraud of a PR group and the other two turncoats that are on the task force. The failure of the PR group and the communications in general needs to be immediately addressed by the task force. Y'all can't just sit there idly and allow this woman to completely derail your efforts to educate the public, whether black or white, about the importance of the task force. If you guys don't address it, then we can all assume that you all are complicit in the sabotage of our of reparations claim. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Keely, next caller, please. On the line 63. Oh. Good morning. My name is Cheryl Thornton, and um, I am a city and county work. I, I work for the city and county of San Francisco. Um, what I'm calling about is is that I want to urge the state task force to continue to um, do, look at black workers, the data for black workers for the state of California, because just like um, black workers in the state of California at the city level. Black workers are the last to be promoted, the harshest um, um, to be disciplined, uh, the uh, first to be fired. Um, and so there's a lot of economic loss that's going on with just in the, in the employment. So I urge you to continue to, um, to study the, uh, the uh, data of black employees for the state of California so that that can maybe flow down to the city and counties uh, through the state of California. Because many people, the largest employer for uh, most black people is a public employment. And we are, again, the last to be promoted, the first to be fired, and uh, we are disciplined the harshest. So thank you. Thank you. Keely? We'll go next to line number 53. Good morning, Task Force. My name is Roy Lee, 1619 Reparation Party represent. Just to reinstate from yesterday's phone line speaker that stated she came from another state and didn't feel like her tax dollars should go to reparation. She claimed welfare and government assistance was greatly taken advantage of. We didn't take advantage of the opportunities given. Facts show that black women account for 68% of associate's degrees, 66% of bachelor's degrees, 71% of master's degrees, and 65% of doctorate degrees, which includes both race and gender. After visiting the African American Museum in Oakland, California, where it validates hard work and black excellence contributed to the country, 
The first video surveillance camera was invented by a black woman, Marie Van Britten Brown. Her invention was the first patent for the type of device granted in the U.S. in 1969. Cell phone. Invented by Henry Van Britten Brown, who invented gamma electric cell, which technology later used to create cell phones. And many more inventions like the invention of the motor, urinalysis machine, the space shuttle arm. Terms of reparation, but what about the contributions to the country that we provided? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Keely? Next to line 66. Hello. Your my name is, is yes. Hello, my name is Yolanda Williams. I am one of the vice presidents of the NAACP. I want to make it very clear that Amos Brown spoke out on his own opinion. I never had any idea that he had ever written such a horrible press release. Our community, our culture does not need programs. Programs have always undermined us. I want to get my reparations money. It can be made in annual payments, that's fine. The Indians got theirs. Why is it such a problem for us to ensure that Black Americans get it? And when we're talking about reparations, we're not talking about reparations for those who are from Africa. We're not talking about Black Africans. It's Black Americans. We deserve it. We have endured all types of racism and harassment. I was a police officer for 32 years and I was harassed the entire time. It was not a pleasant career for me. And I think it is time for us to stop arguing about whether or not we should get the cash payment. Amos Brown is off track. And at this point in time, perhaps you need to think about, is he able to serve with the people? He does not speak for every black American and we cannot let him have that authority or power. Thank you very much. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Keely, next uh, caller. Line 83. Mark, can you hear me? We can. Okay, good morning, members of the task force. My name is Tiffany Quarles and I am a founding member of the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, also known as CJEC and the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants. I want to first of all thank you for your monumental contribution and work for reparative justice. This is no easy task and you have all handled this process of grace. I also want to thank you for your eligibility vote last year for lineage-based reparations, which is the only legally sound and morally correct decision for the community of eligibility. Reparations is about the acknowledgement of crimes against humanity and genocide against a specific group of people. And in this case of California reparations, we are talking specifically and only about African-Americans who descend from persons and slaves in the United States. These are the people who built this nation and fought in every war for the United States, whose cultural gifts have enriched the U.S. and the world over, but have never received any compensation or the recognition they deserve for their contributions to making this nation great. This process is not about ending racism or dealing with the problems of the whole Black race or other disadvantaged groups. If you want to tackle those issues, as Kim Mim said yesterday during public comment, there's a racial justice commission happening right now where issues that collectively affect all Black people and other marginal, marginalized people can be addressed. So on that note, please ensure that when you are completing the final report that all proposals are linear specific to the community of eligibility. This is not the place for race-based or universal policies. Once again, please remove any universal or race-based policies and ensure every proposal is exclusively for those who descend from U.S. slavery. Thank you very much for giving me the space and time to have my voice heard, and I wish you all a successful hearing. Thank you. All right, Keely, we are ready for the next caller. Line 79. Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hello, thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Fatima Gilliam and I'm continuing my remarks from yesterday. I'm a third generation Californian in my 40s. I'm speaking to represent the voice of Californians with strong ties to the state, but were pushed out, driven out, or priced out. If part of the purpose of reparations is to address state harms, then you must consider the state's role in driving people out and displacing them. 
This task force must take into consideration how state action played a role in the state's declining black population and how reparations is an opportunity not just to provide financial restitution for past wrongs, but an opportunity to welcome blacks back into the state with a financial foundation to afford returning. Yes, you're going to have a residency requirement, but if the goal is to atone for past wrongs in California, that analysis must also include the wrongs committed against people who grew up in California but were later driven away or felt that a dwindling black population signaled living there meant exposing ourselves to racist toxicity and trauma on an insupportable level. Task force members, I hope you don't you won't be dismissive of blacks who no longer live there because then the question becomes why don't we live there? What did California do to drive us out? What role does the state play in a declining black population? Excluding people like me conveniently circumvents harms linked to state action that created an environment that drives blacks from the state, but could be repaired, facilitating our return with reparation funds. You need a mechanism for people like me. The benchmark should be intergenerational residents or those who spent key formative years in California. The baseline should be linked to those born and raised in California because I suffered harms, couldn't afford health care, voted in California, paid taxes, and was discriminated against in California. If there are to be reparations, then people, people like me equally deserve to be included in who's deemed eligible. Thank you for your time and for all of your hard work on this important effort. Thank you. Thank you. Keely, we're ready for the next caller. Next is line 49. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Good morning, Chair Moore, Vice Chair Brown, Task Force members. My name is Marcus Champion. I'm a founding member of PJAC and NAASDLA. I'm from Inglewood and I live in South Central. I want to thank the Task Force again for voting for a strong Office of Freedmen Affairs at the last hearing and listening to the experts. I also want to put a challenge out to our lawmakers as well as our community. I challenge the legislators who decide to take on the mantle of sponsoring reparations policy as early as December to not waver in the audacity of every piece of legislation related to reparations. I challenge you to not water down any of our legislation with race-based or universal policy because you think it may be more palatable. I challenge our community to be active in the process and stand with every bill through every committee, through the final signature from start to finish. This is ours and we have to own this process. I will close by emphasizing the final report is for the community of eligibility only. As it currently stands, the final report is full of race-based and universal language. An example from the criminal justice section, declare election day a holiday. From the housing section, readjust area median income limits for state subsidies. From the education section, increase funding to schools through the local control funding formula to address racial disparities. All of these proposals, while positive, are quality, quality of life, universal policy solutions, that any lawmaker can sponsor at any time. They are not targeted. They are not focused on the African-American descendants of persons enslaved in the United States and should not be included in the final report because they are not reparations. Do not water down our reparations. And to the, to the racists who are beginning to take notice, we come in to get our check. Thank you. Thank you. Keely, open up the next line. Next, next is line 59. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning, Task Force members. My name is Kristen Nimmers. I'm calling on behalf of the California Black Power Network. Um, as you begin to finalize recommendations, I wanted to uplift the importance of thinking outside of the box of what may legally be possible. We have seen proof throughout the preliminary report and your discussions that laws are not always just, ethical, or fair. And just as you all have recommended the repeal of Prop 209, but still made policy recommendations where it may be a barrier, we should not be limiting ourselves based on what may come out of the Supreme Court or what may be challenged in the future. <laughs> As my colleague said yesterday, we are setting an example for the country and we cannot afford to get it wrong. <clears throat> These recommendations should be broad and bold and aimed at repairing the full harm to the black community that has resulted from slavery and its lingering effects. Not just what we think we can get, not just what we think that they will allow, any reparations recommendation or package will be challenged, but what are we willing to fight for? It has been difficult for the community to participate in this process as a result of limited comment period and sometimes weekday meetings. But there is broad community support for the recommendations we have made, in addition to the 36 organizations that signed on to the original memo we submitted. Since that submission, we've gained additional support from now over 40 Black community organizations across the state. 
many people are in favor of ensuring that there are multiple ways that people can prove their eligibility, of ensuring we consider equity and, different impact, and differently impacted communities in this process, of ensuring a broad residency requirement and more. In the state survey conducted by the UCLA Bunch Center for you all, 71% of people in the state sample and 60% of people in the black state sample supported broad and inclusive reparations. Our recommendations are based on what we heard in the community listening sessions we hosted for you all in conversations with community leaders working in black communities every day that have deep insight on what would be reparative and what communities want to see. You should all ensure that the recommendations you make align with what the community actually wants and needs rather than what a few loud and consistent voices claim we want. Thank you to Dr. Grills and other members who have lifted up pieces of our memo to be included. And thank you all for this important work. Thank you very much. Keely, our next speaker. Line 48. Good morning. My name is Ishmael Bartley. I'm an information architect with the Redress Institute. I had the privilege to give testimony at the last hearing regarding the structure of the Freedmen's Affairs Agency. I'll begin by saying thank you to the task force for their groundbreaking work to date. I'm calling this morning to express my concern at the proposal given by member Holder. Throughout, throughout Attorney Holder's testimony yesterday, she repeatedly used the term black to describe the target population. Not once did she refer to us as the beneficiary class, nor did she reference the descendant community. At the last hearing, Chair Moore made it clear that, that it was necessary to listen to the descendant community as they are the injured party. Member Tamaki affirmed the task force's intention to honor the lineage standard, and Attorney General Bonta started the day off with no less than 12 references to the, to the descendant community still being affected by the atrocities of slavery. Our colleagues from NASD and CJEC have urged the task force to avoid this race-based, illegal, ambiguous language that will turn this groundbreaking in endeavor into a fool's errand, so it is difficult for me to fathom why Attorney Holder would deliberately injure us with her language. She not only injured us, but she has injured this enterprise with her words. Language has been weaponized against the descendant community, and this single opportunity exists for us to receive the repair, remedy, and redress that will enable us to self-determine and to establish a life-giving politic that will enable the descendant community to operate freely in American society and interact with the world around us from a position of strength and not weakness. Therefore, I implore you to remove this race-based, this, this race-based illegal, harmful language from, the, from, from every part of this historic artifact that will be produced. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, Keely. Line 88. Hi there. This is Sierra Ryder, and I'm a grassroots advocate with the Freedmen's Bureau.org, and I'm calling today to support reparations for Black American freedmen. As a reminder, direct cash repairs owed at the local, state, and federal levels. And for the California state claim, American Freedmen do want to see special code Order 15 continued this year via the Bureau, which distributed land plots to American Freedmen. We do want the Freedmen's Bureau overseen directly by American Freedmen that are either elected or selected by a Democratic lottery process. At this time, we do not want any other nonprofits or investment firms involved with the Bureau's recreation process. At the local level and upheld by the state, some of our biggest issues for American freedmen are in the land and housing area. We encourage the task force to support a position to bring forward a vote for predominantly Black communities in California to determine whether or not they want to divest into incorporated freedmen, freedmen townships. Again, we are dealing with gentrification and displacement in real time. In the fall of 2022, we heard a Latina Democrat and former Los Angeles City Council president admitting on audio that she didn't support another political candidate because that candidate supported Black Americans. I had already emailed the state attorney general, Rob Bonta, prior to that audio being leaked to let him know that I thought the council president was cons conspiring against Black Los Angeles residents. And a month later, the audio leaked with her admitting to doing so. American freedmen have been undermined long enough. We need to take back community control for our collective well-being. One last note, American freedmen ancestry does tie directly to the enslaved African Jamestown's arrivals, but not only. Many of us also have lineage directly tied, tied to the indigenous population that was enslaved in the Americas as well and to the Europeans. We are essentially a tribe of displaced tribes based on this concept of race, based on phenotype dark skin. And that's why it's so critical that we work to stabilize 
our population and we have self-determination for this thank, community. Thank you so much for your comments. I'm so sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your sentence, but thank you for taking the time to call in this morning. Keely, our next uh, speaker, please. 52. Hi, good morning. My name is Jacqueline Clark and I'm in San Diego County. And I wanted to speak today about what my ancestors might have said if they were standing before you today asking for reparations, knowing that it was promised to them through Special Field Order 15, and not just mentioning freedmen, but mentioning Negroes and slaves. We identify as we identify, and we are Negroes. In this case, we will say that what if we had received what was owed to us at that time, there will be no need to be having this conversation present day. There will be no need to be here essentially begging people who have an outside interest in this to do what was supposed to have been done when the special field order went into effect. Now, as far as the, the, the wealth gap goes, the wealth gap in the United States seems to be the most persistent disparity and underlying and cause for every other disparity that Black Americans, descendants of slaves, are experiencing. So closing the wealth gap is the most important thing to do immediately. It would raise people's spirits. It would give them the ability to do what, they, what their white counterparts were able to do when slavery ended, except the white counterparts benefited from slavery, while the Negroes, the slaves, continue to be um, treated harshly and at the direction or with complacency by the United States federal government. So today I'm asking that if there's policy to be put in place, that it, it center around the wealth gap and closing the wealth gap immediately, that there be policies and um, programs or uh, abilities where People can receive direct cash payments. Thank you. Thank you so much for your for your comments this morning. We really the task force really appreciates it. All right, Keely, our next caller. Keely, do we have anyone else in the queue? Oh boy. Okay. Hey. Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yes, this is the Fly America Egg Law to see Mutatis Mutandis. My name is Marcavis Bashar with Johnson Dash Gray. On a Kepara book, Fly America, Aboriginal Civil Society, Instagram, Kepara the Movement, YouTube. I want to present the case of Christ Center Ministries, NAACP lawyers, in subordination to reparation task force accomplishments, none succeed like success. The racial justice action you know, of my pro bono advocacy lawyer, Brittany Cannon, and her referral to the so called affirmative action watchdog organization in the LGBT at Painted Brain when it comes to their unethical behavior. I was excluded and discriminated services direct because I wasn't gay. So I obtained a support team at Project New Star for an evaluation by an occupational therapist for a naturopathic provider, i.e., a doctor favor approach. I appreciate the justice, but if that's what everyone was on, thanks for no thanks. And my Denzel Washington remember the tight voice the best players will play. Dr. Cheryl Grill, thank one MD in your profession that has cured any disease. If they cannot show proof, it is a hope. Young Chip the Great, these Hannibal Lecture, serial killing transnational criminals can go to hell far as I'm concerned. The military does border patrol, not the sheriff department. Lunatics run experiments on their own people is a low down, dirty shame. Trans athlete military science shows and PT, me being an expert, there's a difference. Sports and entertainment biases against heterosexual standing up for themselves a form of insubordination. E.g. UCLA integrative psychiatric clinic or the holistic approach are also insubordinate. Guns legislation should be written by veterans, PTSD or not, stemming from the don't ask, don't tell policy before repeal the reading rainbow and Defensive Marriage Act and the Obama administration. Happy birthday, my son, Dylan Gray, copyrighted, crown of the black prince. I know Amazon is pulling Enron screens on my royalties for my book, Man and Milk and Honey, on social media. Nothing else follow with Stan. It's so excited to get the job done. Thank you for your comments. Keely, do we have someone else? Next, line 55. Hello. Um, 
I understand this reparations task force. I don't know who funded you in the first place. But I have to wonder by only 2% of the population owned slaves historically. And so now we're hearing that the 98% needs to make up for that. Well, what about going after the 2%? The, there are thorough records knowing what ships came here with the slaves, including half a million Irish slaves as well. Those records can be traced back, and you'll end up probably with King Charles these days in England and with the Netherlands. So why aren't you telling those countries they need to make the reparations instead of dumping it on the 98% descendants of people who were never slave owners? To me, this is a farce that you were telling Californians, we have to pay because the 2% did something and we're not going to go after the ship owners. Container ships come into Sacramento every day. We don't check everyone. So human trafficking continues. You're not doing anything about it. This is just absolutely disgusting. And as far as the Indians getting what they needed, no. California Extermination, Indian Extermination Act, it was legal to kill Indians on site till 1910. So get over that. They never got what they needed. Your task force asked more like a click. You've got a selected group you're going to give money to, and everybody else, you know where you can go. I don't think you are honest. I think you're hypocrites. You won't go after the real people, the, mag the shipping companies that today have billions of dollars, and yet they are totally, completely at fault because of their slaveries and their slaver ships. And I think you need to get real and, and stop trying to con the state of California. Kaylee, next speaker. We're going to line 92. Excuse me. Hello, my name is Pamela Smith, and I'm here in Sacramento County. I want to object to, uh, and first of all, thank the, the task force for what they're doing. However, it is, um, there's more needs to be done. Uh, I want to object to this uh, stipulation regarding born in California. Uh, people do migrate. I actually have my second great great grandfather's uh, death certificate, and it says place of birth on line 14 and 16 for great grandma and great 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 grandmother and father. Uh, place of birth, it says slaves. Really, how would you feel if that's what you saw in your? your ancestors uh, death certificate where they were born were slaves. Really? I, I digress. Secondly, we talk about these uh, uh, putting other stipulations. What about the black veterans who uh, came back from the war uh, back in, and they, they were denied GI Bill benefits? What about that? Um, black people as a whole doesn't matter if your ancestors were slaves or not. Black people as a whole in this country have suffered many, many atrocities down to the microcosm of just everyday existence. Can't even breathe. Go to the store. You're being followed while the white cousins are getting away with the goods. This has to be done. It is necessary. Japanese got their in, uh, reparations. Jewish people got their reparations years ago, and yet we're still, here we are, still begging for some crumbs. You can't quantify it because it's unquantifiable. You just have to come to a number. It's huge. It's massive. And I do agree with the pre previous caller about the owners of the ship. Yeah, I'm sorry, your time is up. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, Keely, do we have any other callers? I will go next to line 44. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Derek Hawley, and I'd just like to start off. Um, I'm totally against this. Um, I'm a 61-year-old white male, a truck driver by trade, blue collar. I look at my 8-year-old granddaughter and realize that she's going to be the one paying for this. My family is from the north. We, 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 nobody's ever owned a slave. Uh, and Let's let's talk about what happened in the 60s. And I don't mean the 1860s. I mean the 1960s. My father was plucked from a small town in Oregon, 
shipped overseas where they didn't speak his language. Sound kind of familiar. He's forced to stay there close to two years. The, the land was called Vietnam, obviously. He came back. He did all right by himself, but a lot of them didn't. They're out there on the streets or wherever. Those are the people that need help. Black, white, brown, whatever. And I think what this is going to do, this reparations, is going to create such a divide in this country that I don't think this country can be divided anymore. But this is sure going to be a blow to it. I mean, it was a terrible thing, slavery. I can't imagine it. But I don't owe anybody anything, nor does my family. And I hope you see my point a little bit. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Next uh, speaker, Keeley. Go to line 106. Good morning, task force. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. This is your opportunity to make life-changing decisions, and every change is a result of your actions that will impact California's entire African-American race. I want to ask you, why is it that the slave masters were granted reparations when they lost their slaves and they didn't have to have a task force? Every race has been compensated with reparations with the, expect, with the exception of African-Americans. Atonement for slavery is the beginning of the healing process and of reparative and restorative outcomes. The African-American race is on the brink of extinction, so we need to be classified as a protected race. And finally, federal agencies are quite complacent with the uptick of racial discrimination and exponential increase of police shootings. Reparative justice is an important issue in the United States where blacks are warehoused. You know, while 2% of the shipping industry, I wanna address that young lady, while 2% of the shipping industry is responsible for the transport, 98% is responsible for carrying out heinous, inhumane acts against African-American people. And we're still in suffering. Every systemic racism and every facet of African-American lives exists in the education system, in employment, in finance, in the health care, in housing, in the justice system, in the farming industry. We are disparate and when there's a wealth gap that has to be closed and everybody that gets on here in opposition to change, you're, you're a part of the problem. You're not a part of the solution. I, I call back my time. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Keely, we are ready for the next caller. 45, your line is open. Hey, yeah, peace. What's good, y'all? My name is Cash Gaines. I just want to clarify that I'm Black American on both sides of my family for context of the conversation. I was going to call in to talk about how the 13th Amendment uh, allowed for those who were criminalized to still be uh, paid cents on the dollar. And uh, since reparations is about unpaid wages for slavery, I thought that we might be able to uh, realize some more money being left on the table for those who are owed back pay for uh, being forced to uh, do labor while incarcerated under the war on drugs before. But instead, I want to talk about uh, the state of Oregon. Uh, a year and a half ago, I called into this task force saying that Oregon has suggested Senate Bill 619, which offered $123,000 a year in lifetime payments tax-free. They also had Senate Bill 618, which was the study uh, what black Americans went through to, to help understand if that number was too big or too small, but they at least put numbers on the table. If you, starting at 18, became 50 years old in the state of Oregon, you would be a six millionaire in Oregon at age 50. Now in the state of, excuse me, in the city of, Cal uh, of San Francisco, they suggested tying reparations for 250 years to the area median income, meaning by age 51, with $97,000 a year, uh, at age 51, you'd be a five millionaire. So if we have to have compromise and reparations, what we would suggest in San Francisco's case, and I might say for the entire state is, we keep that lump sum payment, but tie it to those who are over age 50 to receive it uh, uh, first and foremost, because the lump sum needs to be a part of the reparations claim. The last thing I wanna say is that reparations will raise the GDP of certain cities and states as it settles debt and allows for consumption and reinvestment. We cannot afford not to do reparations. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Keely, uh, we have time for a few more callers. We'll go to line 72. Hi. Are you, can you hear me? We can. Okay, hi. My name is Diane. I'm calling to ask you to remember the senior citizens, descendants of slaves. If they weren't born in California, they've lived here many, many years. 
Uh, they've worked very hard. Some of them haven't made Social Security. My mother's buried. She didn't make 50. And she was fighting for all the people. Um, and I remember the last thing she said to me, one of the last things she said, I'm tired of fighting. And this has been so many of our people fighting their entire lives um, who, uh, who've lived through Jim Crow apartheid, left out of their dreams and home ownership. And um, getting help in California is a very demeaning experience. And I think they've made it even more demeaning for black Americans descendants of slaves. Um, so I, I just think that seniors who have lived through a whole lot of this stuff, as we still continue to, because we have never equalized the United States of America, especially for African American people. Um, so uh, many of our people, our parents and whatever, even though working many hard, hard generation after generation, are in poverty in their senior years, even if they made something when they were younger, um, and it never was equal. My father was never paid equally. He was the only black man in his office, and he was the best man, and they knew it. And they promoted everyone over him and always underpaid him. And he told me when I was uh, about 19 or so is when he let me know that he knew that he was paid less than everyone else, but he had his family. And he wasn't going to quit that job, even though he knew he was being cheated. And um, one of my childhood friends was found hung in the police department, in thank the jail. You, thank you so much for your, your comments. I'm so sorry to have to interrupt you in, in the middle of your important statement. But uh, thank you. Keely, our next caller, please. Line 46. Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the task force. Uh, the slave master has an agenda and considers continuing to waste the tax money to push for a war that offers him a feeling of superiority. Constantly proving the ability to single out a person and fight a citizen for the lack of well-being. So the success of the citizen seeking for progress never occurs. Ladies and gentlemen of the task force, it's extremely difficult to take this time from a current and severe struggle to appear with answers and not be heard. What is our agenda? It might seem like most of us are here to prove that we can speak and belittle the system. It's worse to know that upon an appearance, there's only a brief amount of time. People come here, they're coming to aid and assist. We're expecting your ability to provide resources. Only way for us to reach the answer is to let the agenda be known, form and project a holy comprehension for what needs to be done. Offer understanding to those who are here to help and push to perfection. I project a multi-trillion dollar answer for replenishment and a multi-quadrillion dollar business. I continue to feel like I stand alone. How do we begin without subjecting ourselves to further homelessness and weak mentalities? Where are the resources and the people that want to avoid the war that the slave master is seeking? I ask you, how do we get the ball rolling? Do we have access to lawyers that need to start success on a personal level so that we, those of us who have actual proof of these wrongs occurring today can strive to set the bar for what's actually owed? Thank you so much for your comments this morning and taking the time to call in. Uh, Keely, our next caller, please. Find 43. Hello. My name is Jim Leone, and I'd like to first thank the task force for putting this information out on the Internet yesterday so that people could easily access this hotline. Obviously, everybody that's calling in has a vested interest in what they believe are their rights and their opinions. 
Um, my only concern is that when we get down to the brass tacks of it, California cannot financially handle at this point what looks like $800 billion. California is already in a state of decline with their financial resources, and their financial rating is also starting to tumble. We've already had bank failures in the state of California due to, uh, well, let's put it to failed property taxes, and the people are no longer being able to pay what they have to do. And we're looking at corporations that are still trying to put money into the coffers of Democratic politicians. I applaud the Department of Justice for coming in here and at least holding some kind of rule on this type of phone conversations being called in here. But this task force really needs to get back down to the fact of who's going to pay for this and how are you going to pay for this? All you're trying to do is you're trying to gaslight something that's going to make everybody feel better. A lot of people have an opinion on this, and obviously they have a vested opinion and they're very passionate about it good for them, but it doesn't pay for what it is. The only way you're going to do this is to overtax the people of California, and you're going to put it into a financial hardship that's going to become a problem for the rest of the United States. If Gavin Newsom and this task force believe that this is what needs to be done in order to try to make right, come up with a way to pay for it. Come up with a realistic way to pay for it. Those of us that are looking at 40% taxes in California, being Thank you taxed so much if for we your move from California because your we don't want to deal. Uh, Keely, next, next caller. Line 60. Good morning. My name is Mecca Morgan. First, I would like to thank the task force for all their efforts and hard work. Also, I would like to suggest that we have an international trial to legitimize reparations. I'm sure to some that may sound scary and arduous, but simply put, it's a visual presentation of evidence, facts, and irrefutable truth presented to an international audience, akin to the January 6th committee for all the world to see. We owe that to our ancestors, ourselves, and our fellow citizens because there is a lack of knowledge and understanding about reparations. And unfortunately, we have been called upon to show and prove. I am willing to assist in any way that I can. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. Thank you. Kaylee, do we have other callers? We do. We'll go to line 108. Good morning. My name is Andrea Heteru. I'm calling from San Diego. Shout out to member Montgomery Stepp, my city councilwoman. Um, I just wanted to draw attention to the decision that was made during uh, the last uh, meeting in which you decided to have an agency, not just an oversight. And I applaud that. And I also applaud that you amended it so that it said that uh, there would be oversight for agencies that were providing services, but that there would be direct services if needed. And that part did concern me. Um, I'm hoping that member Bradford and member Joan Sawyer will be able to shepherd that through so that the if needed is determined by the actual Freedmen agency themselves. So uh, we wouldn't want other people to decide whether it was needed. We need to be deciding that ourselves. So you do have your work cut out for you. I'm listening to other callers and Member Bradford and Joan Sawyer, you really have your work cut out for you. I applaud this commission. I have I have listened to every minute of it, and I have no reason to believe that a that a single member was not sincere or principled. And I think that you've been brilliant. I think that you've been balanced. I'm just I've been I'm in awe of your work, actually. So thank you for your work, and that's all I have to say. Thank you for your call this morning. Keely, uh, next caller, please. Line 69. Yes, I absolutely oppose the idea of handing out money to any group that has not been personally harmed, especially this group who has had reparations for years. I was born and raised in California. I'm white. I was on my own at 17 with nothing. I put myself through school, attaining an MBA. I worked hard, did not have children I couldn't afford, saved my money, protected my credit, and eventually bought a home. 
I am a victim of affirmative action when as the top candidate for a position, a person of color was selected instead. But I kept working hard and I succeeded. Today, my husband and I have a small farm and contrary to what's been said, the USDA has annual programs and money for minority farmers that I'm not eligible for. You can't fix individual racism. The woman who called me a Karen yesterday, that's racist. And you can't point to a single systemic racist program in place today. They were removed decades ago and replaced with reparations in the form of affirmative action, diversity goals, college admission preferences, subsidized housing, welfare programs, and on and on and on. But instead of taking advantage of these reparations, many have continued to build generational dependence on social programs. Fix that. Stop having children you can't afford who are raised in fatherless homes at an astounding rate that leads to children dropping out of school, committing crimes, using drugs, becoming a burden on society. These disgusting, show me the money, rants, although comical, are just sad. But if you want more handouts, start with your African ancestors in Africa, who were the ones who enslaved your fellow Africans to be traded to Europeans, not Americans. And that's an important distinction because four years after the U.S. won its independence from Britain, it made it illegal to participate in the slave trade or introduce more slaves to America, a bold move at the time. But as we speak, Kamala, the worst VP in American history, is in Africa offering billions to the original slave perpetrator. And isn't she black? That's irony, folks. And that's all I've got to say about this disgusting reparations board. Next speaker, Keely. We're to line 70. Hello? Hello? Your line is open. They got discouraged and hung up because you took so damn long. Your line is open. We'll move on. The next line is 95. Ninety five, your line is open. Hello. Your line is open, ninety five. Is that me? Yes. Uh hi. My name is Tiana Toombs. I'm actually calling from San Diego, California. Um, I just wanted to speak because I've been seeing how vital and critical it is for people from my lineage, American descendants of slavery to actually get reparations, but I would just like to start with some facts. So um, the only reason why AB 3121 was able to be passed was because the legislative aide Maureen Simmons of California introduced the bill AB 3121 and only because of Antonio, I'm sorry, attorney Antonio Moore, who provided all of the necessary data as well as the information to get this bill passed, who then was ultimately pushed out so that all of the information and knowledge that he provided could be bastardized and used and manipulated to actually stop us from getting reparations. Based on the political knowledge and education that I've learned from the president of the ADOS Advocacy Foundation, Yvette Carnell, it has been proven that the only way that we can actually get full, true, authentic cash reparations is through the federal government. The states does not have the proper funding to even provide enough money for us to get reparations. Therefore, this, at this point, this task force is a farce, and then the leader of the task force has blocked her entire Twitter account so that the people who she says she wants to hear from cannot even voice or express their opinions. So in order to actually have a task force that's going to be successful, we have to have people who are willing to stand and put their feet to the fire, hear feedback, hear commentary, and actually be able to ingest it and process it to get the ultimate goal, which is reparations. I don't see that happening. So to anyone who can hear the sound of my voice, if you are truly, if you are actually serious about getting reparations, please go to the adosfoundation.org and sign up. Our chapters are launching soon, and we will actually get the reparations for the federal tax force. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for your call. Uh, Keely, next line, please. We're going to line 77. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. My name is Catherine Wade, and after watching uh, Vice President Kamala Harris' speech in Africa, I really felt my ancestors' spirit. I mean, 
Black African Americans were kidnapped from Africa, brought to America to be enslaved one time. They worked in the fields. They put cocaine and Coca-Cola for them to work so hard and work this country up. We were enslaved again, too, when they dropped uh, cocaine into our community crack. In my generation, they destroyed our families. They incarcerated our black men and women. They stripped us from our, the women from their children. You separated us twice. You brought us here. You enslaved our ancestors. I have doctrine of my grandfather's slavery. And again, we don't want the 40 acres and the mule. The, the land is already claimed, and the mule is no good. He's outdated. We want our money, just like any other culture you paid when you did wrong to them. We, we deserve our money. We don't want to be dependent on other programs for an uh, overseer to watch us be, gain generational wealth for our children. Our ancestors didn't have that choice. And let's talk about police. When my son, Malad Baldwin in Antioch, California, was beat, hunted, and, and died at the hands of the police, and the police is here in Antioch, the same old, same old, just like the slave masters, they're getting away releasing documents to the uh, FBI, federal government, of all the corruptions and beatings and killings that they've done here in California. Let's still talk slavery is going on here in California today. I'm in the 50s. I worked in the fields. My mom didn't graduate because she worked the fields and worked in the white folks' house, you know. So let's talk about slavery. Let's talk about the pain of a black mother having sons in America disenfranchising our children of education, of anything that anybody else has in America. That they, white people inherited what they have off the blood and the backs of our people building this country up. Let's talk about that. We don't need no more programs, mental health. Who's going to help us? Thank you. you. Know, Thank you for your call this morning. Don't know how to Thank they're, they're, you for taking okay. the time to call in. Keely, uh, next caller. We'll go to line 100. Line 100, your line is open. We'll move on. We'll go to line 61. Line 61, your line is open. We'll move on. We'll go to line 81. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> All right, thank you for letting me speak. I'm having a call from LA. Um, from I'm a blogger from the Black American Heritage Club, and I'm not satisfied with the report. I'm a Black American who can trace their lineage past the 1865 census and trace their ties to this land of North America. Um, this report needs much revision. Speak to California, not to federal reparations. California has a racist, sinister history. Starting from 1850, started from 1850 when Cali became a state. So there's no need to mention the transatlantic slave trade to, um, but to the illegal slavery. Speak to the illegal slavery, uh, more domestic human trafficking, redlining that caused wealth gaps and health problems, unjust legal system, more detail like these correctional facilities and the eminent domain of free black Americans uh, that benefited white Americans. It was all these things was help, were to benefit white Californians. And they have used racial terror up and down the coastline that needs to be addressed and redressed. We have misinformed white callers um, calling because you're talking about the slave trade, Shirley. And we need to just start from the, the, the establishment of California. How about the black miners that was never found or had to work uh, all these hours and, and long times in the cold? Like we have a unique history, okay? So I have to woe to you, Gavin Newsom. Governor Gavin Newsom, you are guilty. For three years, black California citizens did not know about reparations happening in their own state. And in this modern day where social media brings everything faster than the controlled TV media, okay? Because thank, unfortunately, thank you we don't, so much um, for your, your nope. comments. I'm sorry to have to cut you off in the middle of your sentence, but thanks for calling in. Keely, this will be our last um, 
person that uh, we hear from via the lines today. Thank you. All right, and that will come from line 64. Line 64, your line is open. We'll move on to line 82. Hello? We can hear you. Oh, yes. Hi. Good morning, Task Force. Yes, my name is Carolyn Rory Simmons, and I have tracked my family history back to slavery, uh, where just by the color of their skin gave another person power and control over them. My mom is 94 and still alive and well, can speak firsthand about the racism in this country. I'm a black woman born and raised in California. I'm not an African American, never been to Africa. I'm a black American indigenous to this land. California is where I was raised and continue to live. I'm an educated woman with degrees. I have lived in my mortgage free home for the past 14 years with a rental property as well. I don't need your education. I don't need your housing. This is just another tactic for the white race to continue to control and dictate how we move forward in this country. I was raised in a predominantly white county and just happened to have gone to school with our governor. I want what is owed to me and would, would love to see my mom benefit from what she witnessed that was stolen from us many years ago. Not only was our land stolen, but our ideas was as well. Not to mention that the slave owners, what they did to our black women back then. I, my family still has property and it's called Sugar Hill because that's what the white man said. There are some mighty fine sugar up there on that hill. We've been through more than what any person can imagine. I've heard the stories, my mom crying about the things that happened to her parents. We were to divide that land up right now, it would cost us to pay for the postage stamp of what it would cost to divide that money up. He who controls the land and the food controls the world. Warren Buffett, the Rothschilds, just to name a few. We have a few families that run this country, about 90% of this country. How can you guys try to say that we are not, oh, we do not have reparations come and that we get them without you guys making a decision as to what we, how we should receive it? I don't need I'm sorry, to your time is up this morning, but uh, I hate to cut you off, but thank you so much for taking the time to get on the call and call the task force and share your comments, and that's to everyone who called in this morning. We're now going to shift to in-person comments, so um, it, and when I call your name, uh, the first five folks who received a number, please come forward, stand up and come forward, approach the mic. William Bronston, Akil L, Chris Lodgins, Lodgkin, and Davis, I believe, Wall Owens, and Mark, uh, I can't, Mesger. I, I apologize in advance if I mispronounced your name. So you have two minutes, so uh, please begin. Welcome and good morning. Cherished members of the task force, and family in the audience. I'm a physician. I was the medical director for two state departments in California for 25 years. The black community and the white community are suffering now under the most barbarous and extractive medical service delivery system that is nothing more than wealth transfer. The one thing that I want to leave you with is the request to look carefully at the five pages that I've given you and the website that is behind this. I spent the last two years with 40 confreres from around the country to put together the most imaginative healthcare delivery system in the world, a system that is not yet included in the single payer models that the California Nurses Association are proposing for the state legislature in the coming two years that we've tried now for nine years in a row to pass. Health is fundamental to the population and the lack of community, the lack of identification between us all as one people, as one caring community and society is heartbreaking to listen to and the wounds that exist in our society. This document essentially lays out very simply the basis of what a comprehensive healthcare delivery system would actually do. First of all, we have all the money in the world right now in the bank to be able to deliver 
what we need to have in terms of comprehensive, unified, rightful, single-tier care in the society. We need to put the public health system at the top of the delivery system. We need to have neighborhood assemblies partnered with local public health departments in order to uh, uh, evaluate and, and monitor and plan and prioritize what needs to be done. We need to have a, a basic change in the workforce. We need to mobilize hundreds of thousands of people through global budgeting of the post-secondary system for all health workers to provide tuition-free training, which would be a profound investment in people. And those people then would serve through assignment to public uh, 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 locations in urban and rural deserts around the state. Thank Please you look so at this much. Document. I'm so sorry to have to interrupt you in the thank middle you of your very sentence, much for your time. thank you for your, your comments it. this Please morning. And look at the Thanks for coming out. Thank you. Next speaker, please come forward. Welcome, good morning, and uh, please begin. Hi, good morning. My name is Akil Kashif L, and I'm here this morning to put a few comments on the public record. Mere exposure to information does not assume understanding of the information. Instruction which fails to consult the understanding of our people hinders our ability to apply the information in real life. African Americans already have a defined territory. We already have a permanent population. We are already capable of interacting with other states in a relationship opposite of a puppet government. And if this society's intent is achieving social justice, then there's no harm too big to remedy. I'm less concerned with the attacking or defending reparation proposals than with illuminating this ethical, legal, and institutional problems. The elite will attempt to fool you in exchanging your rights for taxable privileges and thereby diminishing your rights. Without the establishment of a true national descent name, the nations of the earth have no lawful nor legal obligation to recognize the heritage, birth rights, and immunities of our people. You cannot inherit that which your ancestors, that which is your ancestors, if you do not recognize and acknowledge them and bear their national names. In closing, if you buy into their position, expect to be sold some trashy legal argument or reparation proposal without any substance. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker, if you have two minutes, please speak into the mic. Yes, yes, peace. Chris Lawson, lead organizer, acting president, Coalition for Just and Equitable California. I'm gonna make this as brief as possible because I got to speak last time yesterday. First, I wanna thank each and every single one of you for your work, even those who are not here today. I wanna thank each and every single one of you for your work. Also wanna give a shout out to the DOJ staff. I know this is a lot, so thank you so much for your work too. Also wanna give a shout out to all of the people around the state who've been busting their butt for two plus years to make this happen. There is a lot of people who did a lot of work to make this happen. Regular black folks, as we call ourselves, everyday people who put our time, our energy, our own money into this work. I really wanna show you love. I see you, I appreciate you. Those behind me, those listening, thank you so much for your work. To the task force again, Thank you for your vote for lineage specificity, eligibility. Thank you so much. That is, of course, the right thing to do, was the right thing to do, as was stated earlier. And as we all know, all black people reparations is illegal. All black people reparations is unconstitutional. This is not that, and we are not doing that. Thank you also for your vote for the Freeman Affairs Agency as well. Also, continue to fight and do more as much as you can to fight the, the mis- and disinformation that is going on out there. There's a lot of that. Lastly, I wanna say a few things here, a couple of things here about guarantees of non-repetition. Universal policies, all black people policies are actually a continuation of the harm. That's the opposite of non-repetition because what happens is, as I said yesterday, when you do something for everybody, if you say all rising tides lifts all boats, we don't have a boat, we actually in the water drowning. So when the tide rises, we drown more. No universal policies, no race-based policies. Be bold, be, be strong, be courageous, take a stand just for us, descendants only, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lodson. Uh, next speaker, please come forward and speak into the mic. Uh, that should be... Yes. Uh, my name is Mark Mesger. I'm yes. a lifelong 
California resident, and I find myself in a very unique, unique position. I had a great grandfather who took a bullet during the Civil War as a Union soldier to stop slavery. And I also have a grandson who is black. So it takes for about three or four generations from a white German immigrant taking a bullet as a Union soldier to a black grandson. I'm not asking for reparation for my grandfather for standing up for what he believed in, and I'm not asking for reparation for my grandson. What I am asking for, for my grandson, and for everybody else's grandchildren or their children, be it black, white, uh, green, orange, purple. I'm asking for a voucher system. The voucher system gives the parents and the student the right to get an education that is deserving for them. The money, each child and their parents, the money would follow them. We are spending approximately $15,000 a year for public education. Let the parents, let the student take that voucher system for 12 years from kindergarten to high school. Let the money itself, it will not cost us taxpayers. It won't, talk, it won't cost us nothing because we are already spending it. It is time to educate our children, all colors, all colors. If we start there. Uh, it's a great step forward. I appreciate it. I want to say I'm very impressed with the number of people who are very, very concerned about this. I don't understand some of the problems that the black community has, uh, has uh, lived with. I'm but sorry, I, your time is up, but, but thank I you am for a strong coming proponent out. of the voucher system to educate all of our children thank you. equally. Thanks thank for coming you. out. All right, next we should have, um, we're still in numbers one through five, uh, Ms. Davis and yeah. Aunt Owens, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for being patient. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ann Davis and I'm a part of a movement that just started. I just want you to listen in. Oh, hold on. I'm a part of a movement um, Attention Red and Blue, or Black Voters for Sale. It was a bill that was introduced to Congress called H.R. 40 in 1989 that sat dormant for 33 years. We had nine presidents during that time who did nothing about that. Um, that bill just expired in December of um, 2022. Why do blacks feel like they're owed reparations? The institution of slavery was constitutionally and statutorily sanctioned by the U.S. government, rendering America indebted to African Americans. There's a multitude of organizations fighting for reparations. Our goal is to form one powerhouse, empowered to execute change by denouncing the aftermath of slavery and hold the government accountable for atrocities committed against our people. It's time for reparative justice for African Americans. Stand up for reparations and make our voices heard. Know your words, don't make it so sound. My vote is the same. Can I get a that being said, I encourage this committee in California and all the other committees across the nation to join forces to one powerhouse directed to the federal government because that's who owes us reparations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker should be, uh, last name's Owens? Owens, oh, yes, please come forward. Good morning. Yeah, my name is Wally Owens. Uh, yeah. But go ahead and speak and try to speak uh, into the mic. Force, stack force, thank you for the stack force. But yeah, we need this. Um, you know, jobs and houses going up, gas going up, everything going up. So we need this now. This now, because without this, we save everything. Uh, homeless and everything out here. We need to do something about it. So that's my time. That's it. 
Thank you. Thanks for thanks for showing up today. Um, let's see. Okay, now we'll go to the next group. Norma Haywood. Um, uh, let's see. Dioma Laura Ajfin, number eight. It's basically six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If you have one of those numbers, please come forward, line up, and we should first be hearing from Miss Hayward. Well, good morning again. Um, I was asked yesterday after I got through speaking, how did I find my grandmother's, my fourth grade grandmother's uh, experience of being a slave uh, in her own words. What I did, I Googled my last name. I remember what my father uh, told me about our family and our family name, what, was, what it was before we were kidnapped and brought over here. I Googled my last name, Haywood, and then I found my great-grandmother's on the slaves list. And then I found her in uh, all the volumes. It's called Narratives of Slaves. So you can go to Narratives of Slaves. It's in the uh, Library of Congress. Well, as I sit here, I hear everyone talking about what we deserve, what we don't deserve. I'm looking at this baby, right? Look at this baby. They took our babies and fed them to the alligators. You can't put a price on this baby's head. When they blew off my uncle's heads in front of my grandmother, who was six years old, there's no price for it. But just look at this baby here. They took those babies and fed them to the alligators. You can't put a price on that. I'm just tired of the Karens and the Kins. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for coming out this morning. Uh, next speaker, please. Please come to the mic. It should be number seven, number eight, number nine, and number 10. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for your patience. Good day. My name is Omo Lara Odofin, and I thank everybody for being here. I just want to start off by reading this. Pope Sixtus via Papal Bull. The papal bull issued by Pope Sixtus via documents positive show social progress between the papal states and Italy, Jewish communities in the 16th century. St um, Sixtus V granted Jews full civic rights in this bull and empowered them to establish schools and build synagogues, and the people reduced their taxes and were pardoned for various crimes considered considering the harsh treatment that the Jews um, endured during the Renaissance. Those Jews were my color. These atrocities have been happening because of what the papal bulls have done. They recently, maybe before COVID, apologized to the black nobility. If you guys see these, these flags behind you with the fringes around them, this is war on the people with the spikes. This is the crown of Rome that they have always been paying allegiance to. And the third United States is the one with the post office on top of it, guys. We have to take accountability that we're dealing with three United States, Department of Justice, you guys know what I'm talking about. And we need to have transparency. If we're going to get anything done in this reparations movement, we need transparency and proper education of the people. Because this war on the people, we have been disabled, disabled deliberately. And there is a Disabilities Act that will also help this Reparations Act to enforce the continuous disabling of the people. Not only white people, Mexican people, Chinese people, we all are the same people. But there was a study done by the American Institute Society of all these great scientists from Harvard and everywhere, and they discovered that the DNA of a melanated person has nine series. They've known this forever. We're geniuses. The white man, this Mexican man, the Chinese man, they have six series in their DNA. They are a little less genius than the nine series. I'm so Just sorry like to cut you off in the, the middle of your sentence. So but, please but thank you so much for coming out you. today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we should be Miss Royal. Please Hello. speak into the mic. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, my name is Royal Bassett, First Peter 2 and 9. And Bassett is French, the last name of my form of our former slave owners. First, I would like to honor my ancestors who are now black angels for the opportunity to be heard today. I think it would be wonderful if we start with legislation since this system began with legislation. I already proposed three out of four bills for this legislative calendar, which were all denied by the state of California. 
due to its max capacity, whereas I would like, um, whereas I would have to wait for the following legislative year. Granny's Law, a bill to protect women from discrimination in the healthcare system. Valerie's Promise, a bill to protect women showing special attention to black women who are denied CT scans due to the belief in the medical system that we don't feel pain. Zion's Dream, to teach the youth through a writing workshop called Write Your Pain about the legislative process and how difficult it is to pass laws for black people and people of color. And lastly, Mary and Joseph's Law, to protect Christians from religious persecution in school, work, and government. I would like to personally thank the Reparations Task Force for all that they do, and I will continue to do my part for my people as well. Thank you for saying we do need reparations because slavery was wrong, and there are lasting effects on us. But we are all children of God and deserve to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for coming out today. All right, next we go to the next five speakers, Jonathan Burgess, uh, Ms. Johnson, Mr. and Ms. Johnson. Uh, 11, if you have 11, 12, 13, 14, or 15. So Pearly Barton, Reggie Roman, and Bishop right. Williams. Romain, thank you, thanks for the correction. Good morning. Good, mor uh, good morning. Members of the task force, you guys heard my twin brother speak earlier. I'm going to read something. Um, seems like education's big around here, and hopefully this gentleman can get this to his great grandson or his grandson. My fourth great grandfather is a white man. He's a slave owner. I got this last year regarding Coloma. It says, uh, I'm Marshall Gold Park Ranger's daughter, and I grew up in Coloma in a park home right next to the Thomas House on High Street. I spent my childhood watching my father give up, uh, give, t give groups of talks, tourists, busloads of students making their way through the park and walking past my house about the wonders of James Marshall and his empire and the wary immigrants who came to the era to find their fortunes in the 1800s. After school, I would lie in the big field near the iron single cell gel on my back or pick blackberries from the hills. And on weekends, I would hike the surrounding foothills or swim in the rivers and creeks nearby. I now know every tree, every leaf, every breath in that valley, and I'd never heard of your family, and it's obvious why, Mr. Tamaki. I would absolutely love to help you get this land back. I'm happy to donate, but at least let me know how else I can help. Amy. Amy was a park ranger's daughter. She knows about the land that was taken from my family, and it seems that I go to museums today and I talk about the education. We talk about education, nobody knows about the black pioneer families. In fact, I got a kid's book, right? The only book that talks about one of the pioneer gold rush, uh, my ancestor actually left an autobiography. I go to museum in historic Folsom, and guess what? The slave man, my great, great grandfather, is not shown on the wall. He's actually blocked by, by a piece of wood I can't move. Mr. Tamaki. Every other race, we know their trauma. We know their stories. Dr. Grills, we're supposed to be sharing these stories so that people like this man will know the history, the Karens that we talk about that call, right? I can't even be mad at them. You know why? Because they got the same education I got. Okay? I'm so sorry. When we start your, to your educate our is, people, your we'll time wake is them up. up. Please feel free to. Come back at another meeting or submit your comments in writing. We need to move on to the next speaker. Thank but you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, we should be, the folks who should be lined up are have either 12, 13, 14, or 15, a number. Please, please come and line up. Good morning. Hi, um, I'm Fiani Johnson of East Palo Alto, um, EPA for reparations. Um, as a descendant of a chattel slave, I come here today to say thank you for your attention into looking for a plan for reparations here in California. However, I am disappointed about us having to argue whether a cash payment is or isn't appropriate for our people. I'm disappointed to know that descendants of this state are unaware of this task force and its workings. The sessions have been an inconvenience to our working class descendants, so again, their voices have been silenced. <laughs> 
My forefathers created this country's wealth through chattel slavery, and my brothers and sisters are expanding this country's wealth through mass incarceration. Cash is a part of the repair that we demand redress we demand redress. We are requesting the money and the land to rebuild, rebuild the descendant community. I brought my children here today to see how hard descendants have to fight for something that should be our right. There has not been a system designed for, designed for descendants that other groups have not benefited from, i.e. affirmative action, which is why our descendant community is here requesting atonement, and you cannot separate atonement and cash. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for showing up. We should have in line, if you have number 13, 14, or 15, please come forward and approach the mic. And good morning. You have two minutes, and uh, you may begin, but speak into the mic. Hi, I'm Reggie Romaine, a.k.a. Double R. We get our share. Not only that, <laughs> I like to thank uh, I like to thank my new uh, defense team. Uh, give it up for the national chairman, brother Akbar, with the uh, new Black Panther Party. I appreciate you guys. You guys can also listen at us on Black Power Radio Sundays and Mondays, five through seven. Write this number down: five one five six zero five nine eight eight nine. I would like to put in a motion for land acquisition in April two days to deliberate in LA or the IE at UCLA at the Bunch Center, whatever, on our water, land, and air rights. Can I get a second? Okay, pass that. Okay, the UDHR, uh, let's see, needs to be made law and legislation. Okay, you guys can watch us from this, uh, for 1619, our first interview, uh, 1619 Reparations Party, uh, was, we was interviewed by uh, let's see, this was Friday in Chad on politics in black. Please look at it because it's our political strategies on reparations and many solutions. So I'd like to thank Friday and Chad. Thank you. All right, well, onepercentage.org is the site that you guys can see all our information. I yield back. Thank you so much for coming out. Bishop Williams, good morning. Please come up and make yourself comfortable and speak into the mic. Thank you. Good morning to everyone of the task force. Thank God it's a blessing me being here this morning. Um, I wanna start by saying that uh, Amos Brown is missing, that's good. Okay, that's real good. And he shouldn't be back, all right? because I, I couldn't find my paper to pull him off the task force. Um, and I want to speak on my granddaughter, Shanika William, been missing for over two years. And there's a lot of racist people here from the press and everything of that nature there. I've been speaking on her from Oakland, San Diego, and here and everything. And the only person that interviewed me was a lady down in, uh, a white lady in San Diego asked me a question about her, was interested in it, you know? But this task force here, I'm gonna tell you, I can see further than y'all can. Because of about this $800 million, okay? Uh, you know, during the 1800, that was, um, that was the field niggers and the house niggers. You know what I mean? Yes. And I want to know which one of y'all. Oh. Okay? Because here's what I just like to say. I don't mean no, no harm. Don't Please don't get upset with me. You know, I'm a righteous man. I'm a religious man. And I, I'm, I have the spirit of God in me. God sent me here. Okay? 
Now, the other $800 million, we, we might need a new task force before this is over with because that $800 million, we want to see that money spent on black people, okay? Okay, and I feel that every black person in California should be paid some money, regardless where they from, okay? Y'all give out money to all the other races, all other peoples coming in this, in this country. You give them our money, part of our money, all the army and everything. All the work, money going overseas, to all them people over there in the wars and everything. Part of that money belong to black peoples. The army and everything, part of that money belong to black peoples in the United States. It's time for a truth to be told. You know what I mean? So don't think y'all giving us nothing. You study taking away from us. Study, you know what I mean? And so now, I want to say this here, because I'm not ashamed, afraid, of nobody, not even the people that's over y'all, to govern everybody else, you know? Because me, I'll take the governor court, you know? I, I, I follow, Bishop, I good, good, you know, Bishop I thank you. Thank you so much. Against the railroad your, your time is, is up, but we love yeah. to hear from you. The task force loves to hear from you, and, and thank you for coming out again today. Thank you for coming out again yeah. today and, and sharing sharing with the task force. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are ready for our next five folks. Uh, let's see. If you have number 16, 17, 18, 19, or 20, please um, approach the mic. And the first person should be... Mr. Davis, Frank, or Miss Davis, Frankie Davis, Jr. Please come forward, go ahead and speak Hello. into the mic. Good Greetings, morning. panel, thank you for your work. Uh, thank you for everybody participating. Thank you for everybody participating in this. This is some important stuff. Just found out about this recently. Well, I've been hearing rumors about it. Yesterday I had a chance to witness what was going on for myself. Um, and this morning I was on the webcast and it had some in interruptions. So uh, once again, for the people in the audience on the radio cast, um, my name is Frank Davies. Um, I'm currently at the California Environmental Protection Agency where I work as an engineer for the last 20 plus years, mm -hmm. civil servant. I'm a veteran, I'm a Cal Poly graduate. I was born in Los Angeles, California in 1965, right after the Watts riots. Okay, I grew up in LA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My family is from Louisiana. Um, so all of this pertains to me. I'll just say this, African-Americans, black people, whatever you want to label us this time, we're on an island of destitute, despair, amongst the sea of abundance. And that's like to paraphrase Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I'm just a random, but I am somebody, right? I'm not here with my hands, my hat and my hands begging for anything. Because actually, man, I didn't gave up hope on y'all ever delivering anything to me. And I'm all about helping myself. As you see, I've done quite well. But I'm just here to let my presence be felt and let you see with your own eyes. What about the children? I am the children, but I'm a grown man right now. You can't make me whole impossible, right? But so just let that resonate in your mind. If you guys don't step up to the plate, these youngsters out here, they already taking matters into their own hands. So why don't you get a control of the situation before it get out of control? Thank you. Thanks for Thank coming you. up. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please. Good morning. Gratitude to the real rundown boys. Gratitude to my ancestors. And uh, gratitude to you, Bishop, because I'm also here to pick up the dead carcass of Amos Brown. You know, we all know Amos Brown. The coon, the buffoon, the jump jiving, the disrespectful, the lying, the stealing, poverty pimp that he is, who sits in a pulpit and sweats in the house of God. You want to know why? Because he's the walking devil. 
You disrespect the ancestors, I'm sorry. We're using this bait now. It is what it is. So, anytime you turn your back on $5 million for the people, you're totally against the people. Flat out, honestly. Um, I wanted to get more about the proposal. I can do that next hearing. It is what it is. So, um, I said what I said, I meant what I said. So, he can stay in Africa where it is that shiki or whatever the case may be, or he over with the kids, touch, well, I don't care what he's doing. He can stay there, they can keep him. All right, good. Next, next speaker, please. Good morning, go ahead and make yourself comfortable, raise, bring the mic to yourself. All right, good morning. Good morning, my name's Gail Wilkerson. Um, I'd like to finish up what I didn't finish yesterday. But first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the uh, pity party messaging from the Karens and Beckys and the Kins and everybody else we don't care about. Um, this is not Fox News, and we know what's going on with them. I like to say that I was the first student registered and admitted at Hunters Point number one when it was fresh. I started there, I had my little Navy outfit on. My father took me to school. I was the first one on campus. And two hours later, I was still sitting there. A teacher said, where does she go? Where does she belong? I remember this. I'm five years old. And uh, to me, that's part of reparation. Um, my parents were steered from San Francisco. I was born in San Francisco down to East Menlo Park and East Palo Alto when they could well afford, on the other side, better quality homes. I, today, as a real estate broker, I watched as people come into East Palo Alto with suitcase, I literally, suitcase uh, of cash, $80,000 to a woman I was supposed to list the house for. Most money she ever saw in her life. Her house was worth over $200,000 at that time. Um, but I like to say about people saying about their receiving cash, it's people like her, unknowledgeable, that will be taken advantage of. I like some laws, strong laws put in place that if you take advantage of somebody and steal their reparation money, like they did the 40 acres in the mule field, that they'll go to jail. That, uh, and most of those people are Asians who got their reparation, had enough money to come into East Palo Alto today and take over. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. Next speaker, please. Good morning. Yes, my name is Salah Hakuya Chandler, and myself am from San Francisco, California. And myself am thankful for this opportunity to present the reality of the destruction of the black nation of peoples. There is no excuse for the evil that has taken place for the dehumanizing of us as a nation of people. The robbing and the stealing of our cultural language, the ceremonial rights to teach our young boys to be men and for our black women to be the women that is meant for them to be. And not to address and have not addressed of the disrespect of the femininity as addressing them as hoes, sluts, and tramps, and bees. The uproot of who we are in the ancient of days, before we was enslaved, we was royalty. And you went and you stole America the best. You did not think that we would rise as a nation of peoples. You have called us colored black Negroes, Negras, and all that. We, we are the ancient Hebrews peoples, which means we are males and females in brews of colors. The bottom line is this. We will get reparations because it's spoken in the sacred scrolls that once the 400 years is over, we will not go empty handed. Right. 
But what we have done is put our power into the political system that have built this country in the name of evil. Evil cannot give justice. We are the only nation of people that has the power with the celestial rim to rise and breed the justice. I stand here today in the might of glory of the ancient of where we come from, from the earth, from the moon. You understand the waters and the spiritual air. They say that humanity and the Aquarian energy is here. It is here in all of us. And we have awakened to the consciousness. We ask you for nothing. Thank it is you. ours. Thank you. I need you to Thank you so much that. for your powerful statement this morning. And I want to say, thank you for don't coming use out. Biden, President thank, Biden, thank as you. an excuse to promise we, us what you're going to do. Don't lie and deceive in the thank political you. realm. Thank you. Don't we need lie. to. Thank you for coming out today and taking the time. And we and will we, not allow a religious leader to take our position. Spoken concerning all of these African American boys that have been murdered in this country. These young boys can't even take care of themselves. And you have the audacity to want to know why they're robbing and why they're stealing. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. You want to know why thank our children you. is in the state. The, the, and you want to go around. Thank you so much. We have to go to another person. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You want to know why we are suffering? Why we all crack cocaine? Why the mothers are being abused? You want to know why? And you look down on us. going to say this. Thank you me. have not put in for a state of emergency for all these black children that are murdered in this country and you have the nerve to go support every other country. How dare you? I speak truth. Thank we put an hour and two minutes on a suffrage that we have been going from generation to generation. This cannot be discussed. We need to make this a national and an international emergency to deal with the pain and the suffrage. Okay, we're now, right now, thank you. No more tomorrow. Now, now, give us what's ours, because I'm a promise you. All right, thank you so much. You. Thank you so much. Of this planet, right? And she is going to make sure that we get what's no, no. rightfully ours. Yes, All Many right, we have lots of comfort. We have more paycheck. folks who want to speak. Many of you have taken your position. Thank you. Many of you have made yourself professionals. Many of you added doctors to your name, and there's no healing around here. Let's have an understanding. Let's have an understanding to the reality of what's going on. Yeah, I speak her. the truth. I stare. I carry no guns. I carry no knives, but I carry my soul. I see the injustice that's happening to my people, and you can't put a price on it. Are you understanding Thank you, me? thank you, thank you, I mean thank you. Thank you. We have to hear from I other have. people, but we really other appreciate people. it. Thank you so much. Thank All you right. so much. Thank Next. Y'all heard that. All right, we should, whoever has, whoever has number 20, please come forward. If number 20 is not here, let's move on to folks who have number 21, 22, 23, 24, or 25. I'm, I'm sorry. My name is Yasmin Abdusami. Please speak into the mic. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to say that we have a lot of trauma in our community around this, all of this, and we got to listen to the people. That's very important, and everything everyone has to say is so important, so thank you. Um, my, I would like to speak on, about, Lenny, about the language being used during this hearing. 
I hear several of the task force members and other presenters speaking about race-based harm, race-based solution, and racial equity, and I think that some of you are missing the point. Last year, this task force, almost to the day, voted for five to four for lineage-based repair. Can we specifically focus on the descendant community, on the harms experienced by the descendant community? Can your language reflect um, the, the specific harm that has been done to the descendant community? It is the will of this task force and the will of the people that reparations be lineage-based in California and across the nation. I know that we come from ideologies and organizations that focus on race-based repair, but for the purposes of this bill, can we please focus on the descendant community? Yesterday, a sister called in on behalf of the California Black Power Network to advocate against lineage-based reparations. California Black Network is a fine organization that does good work, but they are yet another anchor organization associated with this task force that does not believe in, rep in lineage-based reparations. These anchor organizations are not advocating for lineage-based reparations, and they are not promoting lineage-based reparations. That's why descendant people in California don't know about AB 3121. So I'm here to say, if you do not believe in lineage-based reparations, step down. If you do not believe in lineage-based rep reparations, disassociate your organization from this task force because we are focused on the repair for descendants. Um, leave the money for organizations that believe in lineage-based repair. Don't take money from this project if you don't believe. Um, I would also like to say thank you to CJEC and ARC for your continued commitment and education thank you. for lineage-based reparations. Thank you so much. Thank you for your patience this morning and thank you for coming out. Uh, next speaker should be Constance French and then Thomas Williams and Darlia Woodards and Miss Joyce and Ronnie Lopes or Lopez. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your work. Yes, Constance French is the name that the owners gave me. So as an African person from the continent of Africa, which they named that too. But anyway, when you came across the water, I became Constance, okay? Chinese woman, she comes across the water. Chinese, Chinatown, there's no argument. You probably went to the Chinese parade, fine. So we're sitting here, and I want to remember, I thank everybody for coming. We have, to, we have to have unity of purpose. You come up and you say your stuff, but remember unity of purpose so we can get something done for the grandchildren and great-grandchildren, okay? That's the most important thing, y'all. Ego aside, no matter how strong, I have Buddhist, Church of God in Christ, Church of God over Christ, Muslim, all kind of Muslim friends. But we still have a basic friendship, you know? We're not fighting and arguing and just tearing each other, oh, no, no, your God is better than my God. You know, we have to have that. Now, back to this thing over here. Okay, I tried to say one statement on one thing. So to um, Becky, I want to, just, just a simple thing, because a lot of us don't even know that. Um, George Washington Carver has a plaque and all that stuff, a name thing for saving the American economy. Becky, Ken, and your mama, um, he saved the American continent, the American, um, the country, economy, okay? So go back and look into real history. We talk about education. Go back and look and see what he did. And you castrated him. So yeah, we need repair. And I'm, I'm with you, I'm so proud of Yasmin, the young lady that just came up before me. She, she is my hope, okay? I'm 76, okay? She's the ne next thing. And she's very, she's always educating us. So she reminds me to say descendants. So at any rate, um, so I'm very proud of her and proud of you. Oh my goodness, here we go, the time I is know, gone. time is up, um, so sorry, is but up. thank you so much up. for coming okay. up. Uh, I want to just say one more thing. Feel free to submit your comments in writing. Okay. It, it, we do have, a, like 
several people behind you, and we're trying to be fair to everyone. Yeah, but, that, that is true. We do need to be fair to but everyone. But thank you. But thank you so very much. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next speaker, please speak into the mic, and remember you have two minutes, and we all appreciate it. Good morning. Good morning. Honorary to my dad, Bishop Williams. I'm here representing King and Warriors. 400 years the seed been planted. 400 years been waiting for the people. 400 years of depressing time. Our harvest of being paid have finally arrived. Now is the time. We've been waiting long enough. Our prayers are right on time. God answered prayers. Release the wealth. People, we're coming out. What God has for us, God has written and set us, delivered and set us free. Task for release is all to the people. You cannot hold on to what not yours. Give it all to the people what is due to the people, for the people. Reparation, not for education, not for community. Reparation is for the people. Let's reap the harvest. Missing black people don't get media press, never. Missing press don't find black people. My daughter's been missing for two years. Shanika Williams, bring my daughter home. In Sacramento, my daughter was missing for two years. I filed a police report with the sheriff's department. Nobody did nothing for two years. Where has the community gone? A white person been on the media missing. They've been on the press for one day, be on the media. Support the harvest reparation. Bring my daughter Shanika home. Now is the time. Now is the time. Let God bring you home. Fight, fight, fight. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next. Next should be Darlia Woodards and Shaquilla Joyce. Good morning. Good day and shalom, everyone. Hope all is well. My name is actually Shaquilla Joyce, and I'm born and raised in Ca uh, Fresno, California, so I drove all the way down to be with you this morning. Um, so I grew up um, in a broken, impoverished black community. Uh, growing up, um, I grew up during the crack epidemic. Um, I just have to say this, our people do not own planes, we don't own trains, we don't own any airplanes or ships or anything like that. So this is uh, this was an attack upon our people, modern day slavery, if you will. Um, you know, it broke up our family um, for many generations. So I am here to stand to be the voice for generations before me, generations after me. Um, my question is, why do black communities lack proper resources, funding, housing, um, uh, mental health opportunities within our country, within this country? And the re reason I say this country is because our ancestors helped build this country. Our ancestors are the ones who built the White House, if you will. So why do we have to struggle so hard with education um, and, and different things, di different dis disparities? Um, again, this is another attack upon our people, and this is modern day slavery. Uh, we constantly deal with uh, police brutality, broken families, et cetera. My question is, where do we really stand in all of this? I am tired of marching, I'm tired of of the press, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So my question is, where do we stand? Where's the resources? And when when do we really overcome? Is this gonna be just another meeting for propaganda or for social media purposes? We need something to be done here. Um, and if I have to keep traveling from Fresno back here to Sacramento at state capitol, I will do so. But I am here, again, standing for generations before me, generations after me, okay? Many blessings to you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, thank you for driving up to Sacramento this morning. Right. This should be Darlia. Good morning. Grand Rising. So my name is Darlia. Come on, honey. Come on. Let's go. 
Hello, my name is? Hello, my name is Dorlia. Mm -hmm. My great, 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 great grandparents were an Aboriginal woman and freeman, enslaved freeman, who planted roots in California as sharecroppers. My family is through all of California from the north to the south borders. We are so deep that we don't even know it. And that part of the separation is the separation of black families. I am homeschooled due to the fact that I was given an opportunity to get away from being humiliated, bullied, and beaten. Not only from the students, but from the teachers and staff. Yeah. Yes. It has been a struggle of being a black girl in California. And as our ancestor, Miss Fannie Lou Hamer said, we are tired of being tired. My great, 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 great grandfather was freed as a child at about seven years old. I can't even imagine running around in sugarcane, cotton, tobacco crops, and clueless to who I am, nor having education. We black people are about 7% of the state's population. Now imagine what it's like to be one of the few blacks in the school, unless you're in the inner city. There is no self-identity or self-awareness of public schools, and if so, you're being bullied. I'm an entrepreneur, and as a, sev and as a black seventh generation Californian, I am barely getting out of the mud. I'm thinking about my lineage and how my great, great, great grandchildren are going to be benefited off any proposed reparations. In our homeschool, we are taught about black economics. Where are the credit unions going to be at? Where are our own hospitals going to be at? Where are our schools going to be at? How and will school benefit? Homeschooling is important, especially for black children to know ourselves. We come from greatness, we are greatness, and to greatness we shall return. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, it is now 11, 11, 10. Um, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven people. Good day, people. everybody. Uh, oh, my, good morning. Uh, good morning. My you, government name's Rodney Lopes, okay. but I'm Sonny Blue Bland. I'm a blues singer, and I got the blues real bad. And I, I just, you know, I appreciate what everybody's doing, but I just think there's a bunch of bull right now. Yeah. And it's like, uh, you know, you ain't gonna bust a grape in golf shoes. You just, this is all just, a, you know, running through the motions, a red tape thing. No, nah, man, come on, put something down. Put something on the wood right now. Oh, and wait till tomorrow, wait till the next meeting. A bunch of bull, and, I, and my dad said it real, my dad was Bobby Blue Bland, the great Mr. Bobby Blue Bland. He said, ain't no love in the heart of the city. And that's exactly what it is. Ain't no love in the heart of the city, and you guys are doing what you gotta do, but don't be part of the problem and not part of the solution. Chair Moore, we have one, two, three, four, five, six people, and it is 11, 11. Should we call them up? All yes. Right. All right, the next, next six folks, Douglas Oliver, Brenda Barrels, Vader, Jamila Land, Ty Wilson, Andrea Jordan. Please line up and uh, we really appreciate you respecting the two minutes. Thank you and good morning and you may begin. Oh, let's see, your mic is not, can you? Hello. Douglas Oliver. There you go. All right, you may begin. Um, first off, I believe reparations in the form of cash right. is, yeah. a, is a setup. Yeah. They gonna get it, half the people don't know how to do taxes. Two years from now, that money could be right back where it came from based on bad filing of taxes. Seems to me, free health care, free education, tax exempt status, land allocation, and a check could have longevity. As far as this lineage thing and how you determine who gets it, why is it all of a sudden discrimination? It wasn't no discrimination when I was falsely imprisoned in this state. I've been here 40-something years. I've been falsely imprisoned. 
and I've lived with the consequences of being a convicted felon in this state. So again, when we make our money, 40% of it is gone in tax. We get taxed when we earn it, we get taxed when we spend it. I don't know how much it costs California, how much money you gotta print to get free education. I don't know how much money you gotta print for land allocation. I don't know how much money you gotta print for free health care. But it seems to me like that would benefit a long time and a lot of people. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking your time. Next speaker, you have two minutes. Please begin. Hi, my name is uh, Brenda Barros. Um, I'm here representing black workers. I haven't heard much conversation what's going on in the workplace. But there are many, many abuses that go on in the workplace that are not being addressed. So you can give me a job, but if I get on that job and I'm abused the whole time I'm there, what have you really given me? You've given me a little bit of money, but, but the consequences and the things I've seen, because I'm a union person, I represent people. We have an issue in San Francisco that we've been pushing really hard about black workers because health, people's health are, are, are involved in this. I've seen people get sick and pretty much die almost based on stresses put on their lives and they don't have mental health. They don't support you. The EEO system in this country is a joke. It doesn't help us, and it needs to be reformed. So I hope whatever form of reparations you do, it includes the redoing of the current EEO system, which does not protect us. It does not. I've never seen in the city of San Francisco one case ever where they decided on the side of the employee. So you know that's a corrupt system. And it's not meant to protect us, it's meant to protect them from us speaking up about the problems and the things they're doing to us. And retaliation is real. When you speak up on these jobs, you pay a price for it. And there needs to be laws in place to stop that too. The current laws do not work, so please fix it. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. Hey, Vader, good, good morning. Man, Rob Bonta, Rob Bonta, a non-black American wants to speak, take our time, and he can't get his justice, his justice department to come here and tell the truth to the people. What's up, Vader? And this task force, I'm watching them, they don't resonate with the things that the people resonate with. The people are out here clapping for what they hear up on this mic, and these people are just unaffected. But they'll let Rob Bonta take our time to, t to talk about Legolas, a, a mythical, what, elf? Is He named his dog after? Well, let's talk about the myths that the Justice Department doesn't know how many black Americans are sitting in their, in their prisons. They don't know how many black Americans that they unjustly put in those prisons. They don't know how many black Americans that they unjustly over police. They don't have any numbers. And this, this panel lets Rob Bonta come in, up in here like he's saving something. He's the AG. Make the AG, make the Justice Department come here and tell the truth about the discrimination against black Americans. All right, all right. Next speaker, good morning. You have two minutes. Good morning, this is Andrea Jordan. And I'm, I'm here today for the liberation of my people. I want to address the Miss Karen that called yesterday and said that she was an immigrant and said, why should she have to pay? Her coming to America of her choosing, coming to America, living the American dream has been based on our nightmare. And that's why there's no place for us to run. We already know what the problem is. What is the solution? The solution is f liberation. I heard the lady up here that said that she was an attorney in uh, Los Angeles and said that she saw the cages and it had taken her back three and 400 years. 
I want to say the whole entire system needs to be dismantled because when my my ancestor, Maya Angelou, said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them. All right, and, and and there's no place for they they they've 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 wiped out everything in the system has to come down, because all facets they've weaponized everything against us everywhere. There's no solace for us. Everything has been weaponized. The water, every single thing, the language, the laws, everything has been weaponized against us. And true liberation starts with money. Because when we walk outside this door, there are people, I tried to get 20 people to come here today. But the wall of shame out there with all the, the, the attempts for reparations. It started years ago. Nobody believes this. Make this real. Put something in our pocket, liberate us. All right, you've enslaved us. They've done everything that they could do. It's not right. We know the problems. Fix it. Fix it. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, I believe this is our last speaker. Good morning. Feel free to, to adjust the mic. For the tall person in the room. Good morning. Good morning. So good afternoon. My name is Jamelia Land. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge every person in the room. And I want to tell you that your collective pain yes. is in fact valid and it is felt. Yes, ma'am. I want to say thank you to every last one of you who have taken on the Herculean effort of this conversation and this movement. I stand before you today to address something that I have heard tad bits of, but I really want to get into it. So one of the areas that you as a task force is looking at is the harm that has been caused by mass incarceration in this state. First and foremost, I want to give a special shout out to Camilla Moore. Thank you for being brave enough to walk into a maximum security prison back in December along with myself and others and have that conversation about the true nature of reparations, you see, because at the core of the word is repair. Repair. Repair for the harm that has been caused. Number one, California is the largest carceral state in the union. We have over 70 factories, AKA plantations, built into our prison system. Do you know that in the state of California, it costs over $100,000 a year to incarcerate an adult and over $300,000 a year to incarcerate a juvenile? Did you know that in the state of California, you pay 55% of your income. I'll give you an example. My husband was incarcerated. He served 24 years. He is also the author of the proposal that became ACA 3 last year, which is now ACA 8 this year, the In Slavery in California Act. And for those of you who do not know or believe that slavery is in fact still real, I'm going to go ahead and give you a little sample of that. You see, the state of California in its penal code, section 2700, has codified that slavery is in fact legal. Paraphrase here, it basically states that inside of every prison in the state of California, every able-bodied person is to give as many hours every day faithfully for labor. I'm Thank sorry. You. Thank it's you. It's okay, I'll be brief. Thank you so much. So, for, your for example, we talk about public safety. We talk about the necessity for our incarcerated people to work and how it helps keep down recidivism, how it helps to pay for victim services and restitution. Final example. My husband was incarcerated 24 years. His last job, he made 74 cents Thank per hour. You. He made, he they took 55%. 
When he went into the system in the late 1990s, he got a bill for $36,000. 24 years later, two Thank months you. after being released, he got a bill for $34,000. Take that into consideration. He was not able to pay $2,000 in restitution after being incarcerated for a total of 24 years. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for coming out today. Thank you everyone who called in, everyone who came in and gave your powerful testimonies. Uh, that concludes public comment today. If you have other comments, feel free. There are two more meetings and then also you can also submit your comments in writing. Always at reparations task force at doj.ca.gov. I will now turn the meeting back over to Chair Moore. Thank you so much, members of the public who called um, and who showed up in person for public comment. Um, the next item on the agenda is item number 17, uh, discussion and action item task force approval of draft report part three, international reparations framework and examples of other reparation schemes. Um, I want to ask the task force, do you all want to go straight into this um, item or do you all want to take a brief break? So we'll take a 10 minute break and we'll we'll resume around 11:35. Thank you. Okay, so we'll be reconvening now to turn to the next item on the agenda. I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson to reestablish a quorum. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin uh, calling roll with Chair um, Moore. Present. Chair Moore is present. Chair, uh, I'm sorry, Vice Chair Brown is absent. Uh, Member Bradford. Here. Member Bradford is present. Member Grills. Present. Member Grills is present. Member Holder. Present. Member Holder is present. Member Joan Sawyer. Member Joan Sawyer is absent. Member Lewis. Present. Member Lewis is present. Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is here. Member Tamaki. Here. Member Tamaki is present. Madam Chair, there are nine members on the task force. The number required for a quorum is five. The number present is seven. Madam Chair, a, a, a quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Uh, so we'll turn to the next item on the agenda, which is agenda item number 17, discussion and action item, task force approval of draft report part three, international reparations framework and examples of other reparation schemes. Thank you, uh, Chair Moore and uh, the task force. Um, I will uh, briefly present and then if uh, you have questions or feedback, uh, that'll be the, that's the, the big chunk of, of this discussion. Um, for this chapter, uh, for chapter 14, International Reparations Framework, uh, we have uh, delineated the uh, UN principles on reparation and talked about what the international framework is, uh, informed by uh, the discussions you all had in the last couple of meetings. You've seen much of this, uh, much of chapters 14 and 15 through outlines that have been uh, presented, shared, and discussed. Uh, most notably in the last meeting. Um, essentially, the international uh, reparations framework seeks to confirm that a full and effective reparation scheme includes all five forms of reparations, including restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition, and requires that uh, this task force essentially decide uh, who qualifies um, what, uh, what constitutes gross uh, violations uh, of human rights laws, uh, what are victims' rights to remedies, 
uh, and what are what must full and effective reparations include under the UN principles. So the chapters that we've drafted, uh, we've sort of taken this issue and um, parsed it into two, two separate components. One is uh, a more theoretical high level discussion of um, what the principles are and how they, in, uh, how they work into the proposal. And then we've gone through a number of examples of different previous um, international and, and domestic uh, repertory and uh, truth and healing type um, uh, actions that have taken place. Uh, and we've tried to uh, compare and contrast. Uh, we've tried to analyze them. Ultimately, all of this is in service to supporting the recommendations that uh, follow in the re remainder of the report in order to satisfy uh, AB 3121's requirement that it comport with these international standards. So um, you've, you've all seen this, uh, seen this in, in sort of outline form, now in draft form, and what we wanna hear from you all is if there's any feedback, concerns, and then I think um, most notably, if there are anything you'd like added in uh, especially any examples of other uh, repertory actions or, or processes that have taken place uh, in, around the world or across the country. And then could you um, also clarify uh, what types of decisions need to be made at the absolute latest today versus the April 10th deadline that you raised uh, yesterday? Oh, sure, sure. Um, so. Uh, April 10th is not is not really a decision deadline. So uh, today is the day for you to sort of decide. Okay, we're going forward with what you've been presented uh, in draft form, essentially to you know endorse that our our the work product that you all are seeing reflects what you all have been instructing the DOJ to execute on and and reflects the will of the task force as a whole, majority of the task force. Um, the April 10th deadline that I've been talking about and we'll continue to talk about is we need edits. If you have edits, either line edits um, or suggestions for things that should be included that haven't been, uh, we really need those by April 10th, um, which will give us uh, around two weeks um, to review, incorporate, go back and forth with you, and then um, include those in a final draft that'll be published in advance of the May 2nd meeting. And then at the May 2nd meeting, we would essentially present to you the final, final report. Uh, we'll highlight any significant changes from what you're seeing today to, to what you're seeing on March 2nd, on May 2nd, um, and then you'll essentially vote you know, again, if there's if there's anything that needs to be taken out, you'd vote to, to remove. That would be the process. So April 10th is not a decision date. It's not a date you won't be communicating with each other outside of the meetings either today or May 2nd. It is really just for you to communicate to the DOJ by that deadline so that we have time to incorporate it. Okay, and a follow-up question. What would be an example of like the types of edits that, um, would be good for the April 10th deadline, but yeah, what, what examples of edits? So uh, most of what you're seeing has been approved in substance um, or in outline form or, or what it, or by the end of the meeting, it will have been confirmed approved as a by majority vote. So the edits would not be, wouldn't be significant. The edits would be typos or, hey, I, there's an idea for another repertory scheme that's not included that we'd like to have analyzed. Um, uh, or there is you know, a discussion here about you know, um, some topic that you think may need to be treated differently or there's some different background material you'd like to have cited. Those kinds of things would be the edits we're talking about. Um, and then if they are get more significant than that, then what we would probably do is draft it and present it in the next meeting for a vote um, on inclusion if it really significantly differs from what's being presented today. So now we're turning to comments and questions from the task force uh, related to um, part three of the report, International Reparations Framework and Examples of Other Reparation Schemes. I'll start off um, 
so as Michael Newman uh, mentioned, you know, under international law, uh, you can't call a reparation scheme reparations or full or effective unless it includes all five forms of reparations under international law, so compensation, restitution, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition. So in terms of feedback uh, to the California DOJ, um, I'm requesting a bit more further analysis on uh, the international and domestic reparation schemes that are already, already delineated in the draft um, and only call the reparation schemes um, reparations if they actually comport with international human rights law standards. So for instance, I think out of all the domestic and international reparation schemes delineated in the report, I think based on my precursory analysis, I think the Germany, Israel um, example was really the only example where uh, full and effective reparations was met or those five forms. Um, I think in terms of further analysis, then all the other reparation schemes that are in there that don't um, include all five forms, they need to be called something else. Um, I don't know what it needs to be called at this this point. Um, a, uh, attempts at repertory justice um, in certain areas, racial equity initiatives, for instance, Evanston. You know, Evanston is not reparations. It's a restorative housing program. Um, and so we need to be very um, clear um, about the precedent that we're setting, um, um, particularly in this section. Um, and so again, everything that doesn't comport with international human rights law standards in terms of what is full and effective reparations needs to be called something else um, is my feedback. I, I think um, there's, I have a question for you, a clarifying question, which is, um, you know, right now that the title of chapter 15 is examples of other reparations programs is, are you saying that you, what you'd like to have, what you'd like to say is uh, examples of other attempts at reparations um, and then add in an analysis of, uh, I, I guess you're really talking about more of a critique of some of these other programs or, or why uh, the task force feels like uh, they should not be considered reparations programs, or I'm trying to. No, it's not a critique. Because I think there was in the Evanston program. I'm not sure who wrote it in there, but I think there was a critique of Evanston in the draft already. I'm not talking about a critique. I'm just talking about what is considered reparations in according according to international law. And as we've stated over and over and over, you can't call a reparations program, whether domestic or international, unless it includes all five of those forms. So everything else. You know, you can't call it reparations. You can, again, I don't know what it could be called. That's why I'm asking for the California DOJ to do some further analysis, do some deeper thinking about what they can be called. But for instance, like Chile, um, some of the other um, international programs, you can maybe call those attempts at repertory justice. Evanston is somewhat different, so it's like racial equity you know, not necessarily reparation. So it just depends on each of the schema that's in there. So it's just gonna require a little bit more work. Okay, we'll, we'll work to, uh, obviously any um, specific edits that you, that you have would be certainly welcome to make sure that we're, um, you know, comporting with your vision for, for those alterations. Um, we'll work on massaging some language that can sort of fulfill that concept. I think uh, obviously the groundbreaking nature of this task force is you know, that we are taking this international perspective pursuant to AB 3121. So I think in, in, inferential in the, in the discussion of chapter 15 is that there are you know, ways in which each of these different methodologies didn't satisfy all, all of them. And we can certainly work on um, developing the analysis on that issue um, and maybe changing the 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 title or something to reflect that. The point is, if all of our recommendations are implemented, we will be, you know, the first government, um, maybe outside of Germany, Israel, to implement full reparations in full accordance of international law. So we need to carve out that space for ourselves, and um, you know, indicate all the other programs, you know, 
as good and great attempts, um, but not necessarily in full accordance of international law, which needs to be respected. Um, particularly for uh, all groups of people who are currently fighting for reparations, not only in the United States, but across the world. We need to send a clear message about what reparations is and what it isn't. Have any comments around that part or question? Um, Member Tamaki, you recognize. Yeah, that was, that was my thought also, uh, Chair Moore. I think that is a good suggestion. Um, you know, the Japanese redress and reparations, Civil Liberties Act of 1988, it is commonly called reparations, but it does not comport with the standards. And I refer to it as more atonement, but you could use uh, some other, but I think it is important to distinguish um, the models. And that's not to say that um, any of these are, as you said, they're good, but in the definition of reparations, it seems to me it makes sense to spell that out. Thank you so much for your insight, Member Tamaki. The only no other note for, for me in this chapter, um, we look at the genocide example, but uh, throughout, um, you know, there's references to uh, black American. And I think we discussed this at our, um, during the, uh, the process of the interim report, you know, whereby, you know, there's footnotes um, and, you know, the contents, um, you know, uh, within the footnotes uh, prescribed, for instance, terms of black and black American, you know, there's not much that we can do with that. So we need to, you know, make sure the language describes with the footnotes. But everywhere else, we need to make sure the language um, is in full accordance with the statute. That um, is the reason why we're all here today. Um, and so I noticed there's been some throughout this chapter, um, black American, African American has been used interchangeably. Um, and so that needs to be fixed. So um, all of the language needs to say African American, except for, um, you know, um, the footnotes that, you know, the contents of which um, state black or black American. So I have, I have specific examples uh, of that in this draft. So for instance, there is language, uh, some of the foot footnotes in the black uh, genocide section clearly say um, African American. So I'm not sure why um, black is used in the genocide section when the footnotes say African American. So we just need to clear that and clean that up. Uh, Grills, you recognize. Can I just get some clarification um, on terms? So if we use the term African-American, um, I, I sense that there's this assumption that it, it is going to somehow really refine and narrow the um, eligible class. But if, I'm, if, I am, if I was born in Nigeria, and then I became, and I established my residency, and then I got my citizenship, then don't I become African American? Chair Moore? Uh, I mean, maybe under the current standards of the Office of Management of Budget and the census uh, records, but currently as we speak, the Office of Management and Budget um, are currently organizing town halls because they're looking to revise the 1997 standards of data collection around race and ethnicity. So they had over three or four town halls this past month. The Wall Street Journal just released an article today, Michelle Hackman, talking about how in this upcoming census, um, there most likely will be a change uh, so that African Americans, those who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States have their own category. And then those um, who are black of, of immigrant origin, whether first, second, third generation or otherwise, that will be 
uh, collected as well. So the census standards, they haven't been updated since 1997, but they will be updated very soon. Right, but we don't know what those updates are, so we can only operate on the basis of what currently exists. And what currently exists, I don't think, is going to provide the, the guardrails about who is being referred to in the use of the term African American. Well, when we talk about what currently exists, respectfully, Member Grills, I'm looking at the statute, and the statute defines who African Americans are. Um, it defines African Americans as those who are descendants of African slaves who were emancipated via the 13th Amendment and who became citizens via the 14th Amendment. And so that's why I'm advocating for the language to be updated to African American to uh, prescribe or to be in full accordance with the statutory language, which again is a reason why we're here today. I'm gonna have to go back and look at the statute because I know that the statute does make, um, does give attention to um, what are they, how do they put it? Um, special consideration for direct descendants. But I don't recall, and maybe you can point out to me where it says African American only includes direct descendants. Sure, I have the PowerPoint that I created around this issue. Um, no, I'm talking about actually from the statute itself. Yeah. In the statute, does it say that? Sure. Um, respect. But we don't need to, I mean, we can look that up now rather than try, but I just wanted to raise the question, does African American actually create the limit, provide the parameters that you are suggesting? And I'm not sure, based on what is currently operating in this country, if that's in fact the case. That's all. Okay. Member Montgomery, step you recognized. Thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, just want to chime in a little bit on this particular uh, issue because I think I, I, we I have brought it up to the DOJ throughout the report, right, about the the use of uh, interchangeable interchangeable terms, and I think for the the way that I am view, viewing it, and I can be corrected, but we are under the governance, so to speak, of the statute. And so what we put forth as a proposal, we can define those terms accordingly. And, and so that people can, as they're reading through the report, reference what we, how we define African American, how we define black American, how we define descendant. <clears throat> and so I think within our universe, we can be very clear about that and I, I, I believe we should be as consistent as possible outside of referencing studies. So we were referencing studies. I think we should stick to whatever language is in the study um, to be consistent and accurate. But um, when we are putting forward our own recommendations, I think we should go forward and um, define it via the statute and or whatever we decide as a body. Thank you. Black American is not mentioned in the statute. At all, at all. Black American is not mentioned in the statute. Um, so a, a couple of things. Uh, so uh, just to refresh, refresh everyone's uh, recollection. So we, we raised this issue. This issue was discussed um, for the interim report. Uh, I believe there were two different conversations. I think that there were a couple of different uh, motions uh, made and discussion on those motions, and they were not, um, they were not uh, resolved. Um, and so in the absence of any you know, sort of specific uh, decision, Member Montgomery steps uh, recollection is correct. We went with, uh, generally speaking, being governed by whatever the s source material included, um, or contextually, uh, and then uh, otherwise interchangeable usage of the terminology. The statute, um, uh, uh, two things. First, the statute has multiple different terminologies that it uses. It does include, uh, when talking about incarceration, I believe, it does include It mentions black once, and it's couched within 
a section that says African Americans have endured certain harms, including this, this, and over a million black people incarcerated. So even then, it gives you context within the statute of who um, the victim or beneficiary class is, which is African Americans. And then um, in the beginning of the statute, again, it defines who African Americans are. Those are descendants of freed African slaves who were emancipated via the 13th Amendment, and their descendants who became citizens of the United States via the 14th Amendment. And as you stated, we've discussed this already last year. I created an entire presentation on it, and it actually was resolved where we agreed at the April hearing that when there's source material that says black or black American, we go with that. Otherwise, we use African American in accordance with the statute. I remember you pulled me to the side in the April hearing and you said, oh, well, you know, there's certain terminology that yada, 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 but we all agreed that, again, with the source material, if it says black or black American, we keep it. Otherwise, we need to use African American to make sure we're in full accordance with the statutory language. So, uh, you know, we discussed in, in uh, the April, I think it was April meeting in San Francisco, it, it's actually a task force decision. In the absence of the task force's decision, we attempted to, you know, Rate, you know, incorporate the task force's voice in the language of the final report of the now draft report, draft of the final report. Um, and that included different advisory committees taking different approaches, different issues applying differently in different contexts. And so it, contextually, and this is, you know, we're talking about in this component of the report, but I think this is more macro for the entire report. I do think, first of all, DOJ would welcome uh, direction to make, to have a uniform uh, reference point. We certainly welcome that and if the task force will you know, have a majority to vote for a particular terminology, we will certainly go with that terminology and implement that across the entire uh, report. I think that's where we did not end up getting to in the interim report process. Um, so if there's a motion to decide one terminology versus another, I think what I'm telling you is you're not necessarily governed by just what is the language in the statute because the statute uses many different terms to refer to uh, the, the individuals covered. So um, it's really a choice of the task forces to give direction to the DOJ as to whatever terminology you all collectively want to use. Thank you. I'll just say, I'll just cite, and folks can go to my website, camillamore.com slash education, where I have an analysis of the statute. So, or you can just go to the oag.ca.gov website to find the full text of AB 3121. And it states that the task force shall perform all of the following duties. The task, forces, the task force must identify, compile, and synthesize the relevant corpus of evidentiary documentation of the institution of slavery that existed within the United States and the colonies that became the United States from 1619 to 1865 inclusive. The task force's documentation and examination shall include the facts related to all of the following. This is important. The federal and state laws that discriminated against formerly enslaved Africans and their descendants who were deemed United States citizens from 1868 to present. We must also study and develop reparations proposals verbatim other forms of discrimination in public and private sectors against freed African slaves and their descendants who were deemed United States citizens from 1868 to present. We also must study and develop reparation proposals around the lingering negative effects of the institution of slavery and the matters described in this section on living African Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States, parentheses, African Americans. We also must study the de jure and de facto discrimination against freed slaves and their descendants from the end of Civil War to present. So also it says, we have to provide a formal apology for African slaves and their descendants. So the apology governs, it should govern, our policy recommendations and the language that's in, that should be in our final report. And again, it defines who African Americans are 
throughout the statute as descendants of freed African slaves who were emancipated via the 13th Amendment and became uh, American citizens via the 14th Amendment. Uh, Chair Moore? You're recognized. Thank you. Can I ask if, if anybody on the task force is opposed to using the term African American exclusively throughout the recommendations? Where, it, where it's, not being, it's not being quoted from something. Right. Is there anybody opposed to that? Okay. All right. So, Michael, I think you have the direction. Uh, just to clarify, yeah. can we get a motion? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I move that where it is not quoted in the report and recommendations that our final report recommendations use the term African American um, instead of the term black or black American. You can you make me repeat it? Yeah, you see? You want, yeah. Except for source material. Except for, except for the source, where it's quoted in the source material. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just to clarify, so in quotes in text, as well as in footnotes and discussion in text related to that source material, we'll still use black or whatever terminology is used in that source material, which will be clear from. So wherever, so wherever it is on a direct quote of some other source of some source material, I am motioning that the report and recommendations use the term African American exclusively. Okay. Thank you. It has been properly moved by member Scott Lewis and properly seconded by member Montgomery Stepp, uh, where there is, um, n where we will use African American um, reference for references of everything in the final report, except for um, any direct quotes that utilize black or black American. That, uh, did I state the motion correctly, um, Member Scott Lewis? Yes, yes, you did, yes. Okay, so I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. <clears throat> Member Bradford. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder. Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Member Tamaki. Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair. There are seven members present and voting. There were seven ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions. Thank you. Uh, there are seven ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions. Thus, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Um, any other comments or questions, um, feedback related to uh, draft report um, number three, international reparations framework and examples of other reparation schemes? Okay. If there are none, then we can entertain a motion to um, accept the draft with uh, the uh, changes that we just discussed, which would include the, the motion that just passed, and then also um, further analysis from the California DOJ um, around the domestic and international um, schema, identifying which of these actually fully comports with international human rights law standards. Just, just to clarify, so the motion that was just passed is for the entire report. So th that'll be, that applies to everything. It's not just related to this okay. chapter. Um, 
And I would just note that we do have an, one additional component of the examples in another state that we're still working on in Florida. So um, that, uh, that would be subject to the same vote. So it would be included in there. We still have a motion to accept the draft to move forward. Uh, Member Montgomery, Seb, you're recognized. Uh, I, I move that we accept the draft, uh, incorporating the feedback that was uh, given by task force members. There's a second. second. It has been properly moved by Member Montgomery Stepp and properly seconded by Member Scott Lewis that we accept uh, the draft uh, part, uh, sorry, yeah, part three, international reparations framework and examples of other reparation schemes uh, with the feedback that we just uh, discussed. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Thank you. Madam, excuse me, Madam Chair? Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Vice Chair Brown is absent. Madam, uh, I'm sorry, Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford vote, votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Step, I'm sorry, Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there were seven members present in voting. There were seven ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions. Thank you. There are seven ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions. Uh, the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Uh, thank you all, uh, California DOJ, for the work you've done on this section um, as well. Uh, so the next item on the agenda is lunch. Um, I did want to uh, mention, I know um, we want to say that we are in full support, or I want to say I am in full support of the Native American community. and. Um, the, Cal the, the state of California, Governor Gavin Newsom, actually created via an executive order the California Truth and Healing Council. And one of their um, mandates is actually to develop reparation proposals for California natives by the year 2025. I don't know, maybe uh, we can talk about this later, about maybe inviting someone from the Truth and Healing Council to give us a presentation, uh, like we've done for various different local and municipal uh, reparations efforts across the state. But I did want to make that um, announcement that there is a council um, to provide reparative justice to California natives um, in the state. And they've been having listening sessions over the past year or so. So if folks want to have, uh, if folks want to learn more about that, you can go to tribalaffairs.ca.gov. So now we'll turn to lunch um, and we'll return at 145. <laughs> 